Buenas tardes. My name is Carlos Menchaca. I'm a New York City Council member uh, representing District 38. But today I am here as the chair of the City Council's Committee on Immigration. Thank you all for joining us uh, in today's hearing slash celebration. Uh, and it is exciting to celebrate because there have been so many accomplishments uh, for the topic at hand. Uh, in the last four years, we did some really great things together around our city's municipal identification card. What we call, with so much um, love, IDNYC. Uh, and we also wanna explore the future of this card as we continue to expand it. But if we wanna fully celebrate we have to lift up the fuller story of IDNYC. And we have to go back further than 2014 when we passed the bill that set this program in motion. Uh, you're gonna hear later from Councilmember Danny Drum, uh, who uh, was the co-prime sponsor for this bill. Um, but we have to think about this in the national climate. Nationally, local advocates have been pushing local municipalities to create government-issued identification cards. Many people in cities across the country reported issues with being eligible for identification cards so that they could enter their city buildings to get a library card, to open up bank accounts. And not having an ID, not having an ID when interacting with police, when getting stopped, or in the attempt to report a crime, well, we know that that's problematic. This was the conversation at that time going across the country. There was great need. New York City was not the first to launch a city ID, and ID card. We followed Oakland and San Francisco and California, Hartford, Connecticut, and even Newark, New Jersey. We were not the first but the New York City Coalition of Advocates and the people demanded that the concept that we create in New York City was the best. And New York Coalition and all the advocates was a diverse group of people. During our public hearings, we heard from homeless advocates, from the transgender and gender non-conforming community to ensure that we could build a program where New Yorkers could choose their gender, M or F, and now X, or no gender at all community organizers fighting for immigration rights and criminal justice reforms made the case to stop the deportation machine by showing, the, showing us the power of having our local NYPD accept this ID and issue a summons if they were stopped on the street. We know that there were and continue to be issues with New Yorkers who want to open up bank accounts and the advocates pushed the city to figure out solutions and they did. And we're gonna keep talking about how we're gonna grow that opportunity from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. The stars did not align when Quinn as speaker and Bloomberg as mayor were in power, and that's the truth. Though as council member and chair, uh, Danny Drum of the Immigration Committee, he fought really hard to ensure that that conversation stayed alive and that the advocates felt like there was a voice in the city council. And I wanna thank council member then chair of the Immigration Committee, Danny Drone, for holding that space. Everything changed when the leadership in government changed. Mayor de Blasio was elected as mayor. The city council elected Mark Riverito as the speaker, and then I became the chair of the Immigration Committee. Immediately after the elections, immediately after the elections, this is in 2013, advocates requested a meeting with me to discuss the immigration agenda. And at the top of that list was the municipal card concept. I met with the coalition before I, I was even sworn in in 2014. And in that room uh, was our amazing commissioner um, Agarwal. Uh, and I'll never forget that, that moment. What I was describing to you, uh, what I'm describing to you right now is the best of democracy, a participatory democracy that can create legislation designed by the people for the people. It is the strongest value that founded this program, and I say this today as a reminder, not just to the city council, the policymakers, but also to you as the mayor's office. That is the essence of this card. 
that the people demanded that from government. From every borough, from every experience, they joined together and they demanded that we respond. And we did. In 2014, my colleague and friend, Councilmember Drum, and I co-sponsored the bill that became the Local Law 35 of 2014. This law created the IDNYC program, which launched on January 12, 2015. Under this program, every New York City resident could obtain an IDNYC card, regardless of race, national origin, citizenship status, gender, sexual orientation, etc. The IDNYC program removed barriers to obtaining a government-issued ID for some of the most vulnerable populations, immigrants, of course, but additionally homeless, young people, the elderly, limited English proficient uh, New Yorkers, LGBTQ New Yorkers, people like me who don't have a car or want to drive. I don't have a driver's license. Um, I ride a bike. But again, we were not the first. But I think that we can say that our community-led program can be proud as we call it the best. Almost 1.3 million cardholders, New Yorkers as young as 10 years old and college students, you can determine your own gender uh, uh, or you have an option to have no gender or M, F, or X. IDNYC is an accessible and secure card that enables residents to access city services, get admission to city buildings such as schools, and also serves as proof of identification for interacting with the police. It is additionally an accepted form of identification for opening an, a banking account with select financial institutions and can be used at any public library in New York. Lastly, it also provides additional benefits to allow New Yorkers to access cultural institutions in the city and enjoy the city's leading museums and concert halls and zoos and botanic gardens. Uh, I myself enjoyed going to some of these places that I'd never thought I would go before, but now that I had access, I went. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that did that. What's most important is that IDNYC New York City extended the access to city services that have been difficult or impossible to access without identification. Perhaps most troubling to me, parents that came to me from my district that could not enter their own child's school without a valid ID. They were stopped at the front, which is policy, which is good policy. And these are the stories that came to us from our neighbors in our districts to this committee, to all of us, for that we all heard their stories. And from the beginning, this card has been a card for all New Yorkers, a source of pride belonging to this program, which is why we worked with this administration to diversify the gender designations on the card and ensure that more flexible proof of residency was also accepted. A cornerstone, a cornerstone of the program has always been privacy, even as the program took off. To date, we have over one million cardholders in the city. We work closely with the administration to ensure that applicants' records were not kept or attached to personally identifi identifiable information so that we could encourage our communities to enroll in the program without risking their safety and anonymity. We understand that the administration is considering expanding the card to add a smart chip function, which raises questions about privacy and security. As we discuss the program's history and its future today, we want to ensure that these questions can be raised and discussed to make sure that the next iteration of the card is one that reflects the safety and the best interest of all New Yorkers. That is our commitment. Today, we want to reflect on the strides we've taken in, I in IDNYC, celebrate, uh, from its inception as a local law to the widely recognized program it is today. We also wanted to look into the future, and I look forward to hearing from the administration about the next iteration of the IDNYC program, what we have started to call IDNYC 2.0. Uh, we want to reestablish our commitment to the initial intent and visit no, to the initial intent and vision of IDNYC as an ID card for all New Yorkers as we explore other functions and other partnerships, both that are probably already on the table of the city, but are probably in our hearts. And we did tweet out, if you want to send some suggestions, we're capturing those suggestions so that we can keep this conversation going. I want to thank uh, our staff, uh, the whole committee staff, Committee Council Harbani Ahuja, Committee Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, and Finance Analyst Jin Lee, and my, my Chief of Staff, Soshi Meng, and Communications Director, Tony Chirito. I want to open the floor uh, to 
uh, Council Member Drum and, 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 and co-prime sponsor of this bill uh, to say a few words uh, and reflections on the card as we begin our, our first, before we begin our first panel of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Council Member Drum. <coughs> Excuse me, well thank you uh, Chairman Chappell, that's uh, very generous of you. I didn't actually expect to give it any type of opening statement. But um, I do want to thank you um, as well for your very kind words about uh, initially passing the legislation for the IDNYC. I actually look at it as being the highlight of my career in the City Council, and I think that it has been hugely successful. I think we're at about 1.2 million cardholders, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and the security of the card has always been of utmost concern to all of us involved. And I know that that's been true with the Mayor's Office as well. I remember about uh, two years or so ago when a certain assemblywoman tried to sue to seek the information from the card and how hard the de Blasio administration, and I want to congratulate um, the commissioner as well, for standing up to that type of a threat and uh, ensuring that, um, that the card remains safe. And as I said, that has always been our top concern, and I know that that's very true for the administration as well. So I think you are correct to talk about uh, the um, addition of a, of a, of a chip, um, but I do have confidence that uh, we'll be able to work this out and that the administration will also uh, make sure that uh, if a chip is in fact included, and I think it's only in the beginning stages if I'm not mistaken, um, that, um, um, you know, that that chip will um, protect everyone's privacy. So, um, you know, I have to tell my one story that I love about the IDNYC is that I went to Las Vegas about uh, three years ago, and every time I turned around, there was a sign on the wall, if you show your New York City IDNYC card, you get 10% off of Madame Tussaud, uh, you get 10% off everything, even the gun range, which I didn't go to, but I couldn't believe that you get 10% off or 20% off everywhere you go in Las Vegas. So bring those IDNYC cards with you when you travel outside the state, because other states are catching on to the good that happened to us here as well. So um, I want to thank you for conducting this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from the administration as well. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Drum. And I, I want to echo that. This was the first bill that I passed uh, in my career. And working with you and your team was something that I'll never forget. And not only that, um, I learned so much about how to pass a good bill uh, with community being at the, at the real center of this, of this initiative. Thank you. Okay, we're ready. Great. I hope you are. Let's do this. Um, we're, gonna, we're, gonna have to, we're gonna swear you in. Great. Um, and yes. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Great. Um, I've never heard that story. That is an incredible story. Um, and um, I feel like now we should test it in many different states and see what's possible. But beyond that, <laughs> thank you to Chairman Chaka, Council Member Drum, and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, Sonia Daly, from the Department of Social Services, who is also available to answer questions. It is remarkable to take a few moments here with the sponsors of the local law and our partners in the community and advocacy groups to reflect on the IDNYC program more than four years since our launch in January of 2015. And as we approach our first set of renewals, which will be in January of 2020. I have been fortunate to have been a part of the birth and incredible growth of the IDNYC program since, it's, since before its launch in 2014. First as the Director of External Affairs, then as Assistant Commissioner, and now as Commissioner of Moya. I am proud that more than 1.2 million New Yorkers now carry an IDNYC card, more than 18% of our city's population, age 10 and older. But setting aside the sheer size and reach of the program, I also want to share a few stories about some of the people who have become cardholders to help paint a picture of what the city and the city council have accomplished. A Queens housekeeper in her 60s who never had a bank account despite living in New York City for 27 years. A Puerto Rican woman who was raising her granddaughter after the child's mother passed away and wanted help finding educational activities to bring her to. 
an immigrant who only had photo ID from his country of origin and faced discrimination when asked to present it. An elderly man who could not speak English and suffered a fall while walking in Chinatown and had his IDNYC with language preference and emergency contact listed on the back. A working mother whose daughter had never seen the elephants that her mother had gone, gone to see in India as a child. For these people, IDNYC has been more than just a piece of plastic in their wallets. It has been a facilitator of access, a key to unlock the services and support, as well as the best of New York City's cultural offerings. It allowed that housekeeper to open her first bank account. It meant that the man who fell was given the appropriate assistance right away. It meant that the woman from India could afford to bring her daughter to the zoo for the first time in her life. These people are the faces of IDNYC's successes. They are the New Yorkers who, because of their income, of their language, of their immigration status or other, had been denied the full participation in the life of the city that they deserved. With IDNYC, I'm happy to say that we have helped to make a difference in their lives and to begin an ad to address these kinds of inequities in access and opportunity. Not just for immigrants, but for New Yorkers of all backgrounds and circumstances. It is a pleasure to have this time to testify about how we got to where we are today and where we can go in the future to continue to grow and build IDNYC to even better serve our residents. When he entered office in 2014, Mayor de Blasio promised to create a municipal ID card. The Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Human Resources Administration, and the Office of Operations, along with others in the administration, worked closely with the council leading to the passage of Local Law 35 less than six months into the session. The, the law directed the administration to develop and launch the program, set standards for acceptable application documentation, and provided the framework for confidentiality protections that remain in place today. The law also required city agencies to accept the card to access services and directed the administration to continue to build the program by increasing access and securing acceptance by other entities, including financial institutions, private businesses, and non-local government agencies. We worked quickly to get the program up and running in a matter of months, partnering closely with the city council, advocacy organizations, and community groups to inform the process. We hired and trained a remarkable and diverse staff promulgated rules and regulations, built computer systems, worked with designers and artists, developed a massive public education campaign, and negotiated benefits and more. In January of 2015, the mayor and then speaker, speaker Melissa Mark Viverito launched IDNYC at the Flushing branch of the Queens Library and we opened our doors to applicants. Demand quickly exceeded our expectation. The Human Resources Administration, which was tasked with the administration of the program, rapidly hired more staff and opened more enrollment centers in the first year alone. We enrolled more than 700,000 cardholders, including former United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and an honorary basis, Pope Francis. Importantly, we took care to build the program to deliver on our promise to New Yorkers to create a card that works for everyone while addressing the needs and concerns of those most vulnerable amongst us. One of the crucial early decisions in program development was the imperative of creating a card program that would prove valuable to all New Yorkers and not just undocumented immigrants or the homeless or underserved communities. This decision avoided stigmatizing the use of the card as a symbol of populations that have traditionally been victims of discrimination. Among the best examples of this was our partnership with the members of the Cultural Institutions Group the several dozen museums and theaters and other cultural institutions that operate on city property, such as the American Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, El Museo del Barrio, BAM, and many more. They were crucial early partners and played an indispensable role in our efforts to demonstrate that IDNYC is for all New Yorkers. I personally spent considerable time at enrollment centers at the beginning of the program, days, nights, and weekends, I helped our staff as they were beginning this incredible initiative and working through challenges, working with our wonderful on-the-ground partners to ensure efficiency and cooperation as we looked at a quick expansion in response to the demand, and of course, assisting New Yorkers who were coming in to learn about the program, determine their eligibility, and share with me why this was so significant for them. The IDNYC program grew dramatically over the several years following the launch. We now have 20 permanent enrollment centers across the city, 
five pop-up enrollment teams to host temporary sites in additional locations, a significant increase over the 18 that were in operation at the launch in 2015. We have also created a homebound system to bring enrollment equipment to those applicants who need a reasonable accommodation due to their inability to visit one of our sites, as well as a mobile command center to bring IDNYC enrollment wherever it's needed, particularly areas in which the city does not have permanent centers. The IDNYC program became an important part of the life of the city, facilitating access to city services and other benefits for a huge number of our residents. This would not have been possible without the exceptional and careful attention paid to privacy and confidentiality protections throughout the development and administration of the program. These protections have remained and will remain intact as they stand as a lesson for other cities and counties seeking to replicate a measure of IDNYC success. The first priority must be the protection of cardholder information. In line with this goal, at the end of 2016, Commissioner Banks made a determination pursuant to the local law that it was no longer necessary for the program to retain copies of the documents submitted by applicants after they have been evaluated and authenticated by our staff, further building on our privacy and confidentiality protections and promise. In 2016, we brought in outside researchers to conduct an evaluation of the program and share their findings. Their report, which is available on our website, helped to confirm that the program had indeed succeeded in many ways and in many respects. Some of the results that have stayed with me the most are that 94% of cardholders surveyed reported that it was easy to go through the enrollment process. 72% of those who used IDNYC to access public benefits said that the card had helped them in doing so. 59% of those who expressed concerns about interactions with the police said that having an IDNYC made them feel more comfortable about doing so. And 77% of immigrants surveyed said the card gave them a greater sense of belonging in the city. These results demonstrated that even just in a relatively short time in the life of the program, IDNYC had already achieved real positive outcomes and made a difference in the lives of New Yorkers. IDNYC has continued to expand. A few salient examples, we established a fruitful partnership with the Department of Education to conduct enrollment at high schools. We worked with the Department of Homeless Services and the New York State Office of Mental Health to help enroll shelter residents and individuals with mental health disabilities. We launched an online portal to make the program easier to access and on mobile devices. Our successes span multiple areas. We've connected cardholders to over 640,000 cultural institution memberships, saved shoppers more than 1.9 million in groceries at Food Bazaar, and more than $800,000 in prescription medications, connected 87,000 cardholders to their library accounts with their IDNYC, and more. As I travel across the city and meet people of all walks of life, I'm continually gratified that the program has remained popular and appreciated and has been embraced by both community members as well as by organizational partners. In recent months, we've made a number of new advancements. Those include opening eligibility to children aged 10 to 13, building an electronic verification system for certain categories of information, completing our integration with all New York City Health and Hospitals facilities, and just a few weeks ago, changing our application system to allow cardholders to identify their gender as X if they so choose. As IDNYC approaches its fifth birthday in January of 2020, we have been considering the ways in which the program can continue to improve and to serve residents in new ways. Based on our learnings working in communities and with partners, at our enrollment centers, through our customer service line, as well as from serving our cardholders, we strive to continue to build on a promise we set forth at the outset of the program through innovation and new partnerships. Accordingly, we have worked in tandem with the city's chief technology officer, our sister agencies and external partners to explore new opportunities for the card. We are looking to address key issues and challenges raised by cardholders and set out in the local law, many of which have been elevated to us by partners, elected officials and advocates and expressed to us by cardholders. These include expanding access to banking, integrating this card further into other systems so that it can function in a range of circumstances, including the option of potentially using it to enter the MTA, and full acceptance by pharmacies as identification to pick up prescriptions. 
As I described above, expanding New Yorkers' access to financial services has always been a goal of the program. During the development of IDNYC, the administration met with a range of banks and credit unions and obtained positive written guidance from federal and state financial regulatory agencies. This effort has yielded us 14 financial institutions that currently accept IDNYC as a form of primary identification to open an account, including the addition of a new bank, People's United Bank, as recently as last month. We have conducted significant public education and outreach about the opportunities for financial access afforded by IDNYC, including a multilingual informational materials, pop-up enrollment services or centers offered at banks and credit union branches, branches and a major transit-based advertising campaign in conjunction with the Department of Consumer Affairs. We are pleased that we have been able to assemble these 14 options for cardholders, and we hope to continue to add more in the future. However, we have heard repeatedly from cardholders that access to banking remains a major unmet need for too many. We simply have not been able to fully achieve our goal of achieving broad access and making a large-scale dent in the size of the unbanked and underbanked populations in the city. As a result, we're now in the process of exploring the possibility of adding a payment and banking feature on a smart chip on the IDNYC card. It is important to note that exploring means just that. We have taken this process seriously and understand the importance of engaging an array of voices to inform any decision. We began learning about technology options, including financial services for integrations in 2017. We briefed elected officials and many organizations critical to the program in the summer of 2018 before launching a challenge with the chief technology officer's office. And we shared updates in the late summer on what we learned from our exploration. We then informed stakeholders in late 2018 that we wanted to continue this process through a notice of intent to enter into negotiations and that we would invite ongoing discussion as we continue to learn more. In our notice, we asked <coughs> interested parties to explain whether and how they could broaden financial access for New Yorkers while protecting cardholders' information and offering a consumer-friendly financial product. That exploration is in process that is currently underway. We will continue to engage in conversations and we appreciate and value the questions and concerns that have been raised throughout this process. We look forward to ensuring that all voices are heard and that we can bring to any decision making the voices of our partners as well as New Yorkers more broadly. I want to make very clear that if we are not satisfied that we can obtain the protections and the benefits that we seek for our cardholders, we are not under any obligation to award a contract and we will not do so. In addition, to seeking options for how we can expand access to financial services, we're also examining methods to increase integrations and access through the card. By way of example, we're looking at how the IDNYC can serve as contactless payment for a metro card on MTA subways and buses. This is a function we've always hoped to be able to provide and has been one of the most consistent requests from cardholders and New Yorkers broadly. Now the MTA is in the process of adopting a contactless payment turnstile system slated to be in place citywide as early as 18 months from now. We have taken this opportunity into consideration through this process as well. We've also been exploring how we can secure full acceptance of the IDNYC card by pharmacies for pickup of prescription medications. Currently, the IDNYC is widely accepted by pharmacies for most pur purposes and pickup of most prescription medications. Thanks in part to a Dear Pharmacist letter from the commissioners of Moya DSS and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and a notice we placed in the New York State Medicaid Update newsletter in 2016. However, because of the technological card scanning requirements imposed by pharmacies in response to federal methamphetamine control laws, the IDNYC has generally not been accepted for purposes of registration of a purchase of pharmaceutical products that contain methamphetamine precursors like common medicines that include the very common decongestant pseudoephedrine. We're exploring whether this problem could be addressed by adopting a 2D barcode on the card rather than the 1D that we currently have. We also hope to expand the functionality of IDNYC through new state legislation. Although we've ex secured acceptance with a number of state agencies, including the Education Department, the Department of Health, and the Department of State, there are a number of areas in which state agencies and private businesses' acceptance of the card has been limited by state laws that, in most cases, simply did not anticipate the creation of a municipality-issued identification card. 
We look forward to working with the City Council and others to explore possible state legislative solutions in these areas. Lastly, among the most important and most immediate future needs of the program will be renewals, beginning just 11 months from now. We are well underway in the process of developing an efficient and easy to use renewal system, and we will share more information on that soon so that cardholders can plan to get their new IDNYC cards and continue to take advantage of the program. Let me reiterate here a few things. Every decision that is made around IDNYC has held at its core a few key values and goals. Ensuring access for vulnerable New Yorkers who have been left without identification for too long, a commitment to protecting the privacy of cardholders, a commitment to program integrity and safety in partnership with the NYPD and HRA's Investigation, Revenue and Enforcement Administration, a promise that a program works for all New Yorkers to ensure no one is isolated or stigmatized for use of the card, and fulfilling our obligation to ensure the continued growth of the program. In consultation with myriad crucial voices from the council and advocates to cardholders and community-based organizations and other partners. I want to end by thanking you for the opportunity to testify today and for the council's partnership. And if I may, I would like to add how deeply proud I have been to be a part of this program and how grateful I am to so many for these experiences. In particular, I want to say to the many staff who worked day and night to get things right and who continue to show up with the spirit of the program day in and day out and to the over one million New Yorkers who've embraced IDNYC in ways that may have seemed unimaginable and those who enrolled in solidarity with those who lacked other options for identification. You have demonstrated that collectively we are New Yorkers. We all belong here, regardless of language, gender identity, homelessness, or immigration status, and all of the other things that make us all unique New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, I am just very, um, thankful that we are here talking about this card and the, um, not just the accomplishments, but how we're thinking about this going forward. And before I move forward, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge that we have been joined by other members of the Immigration Committee, including from Queens, Councilmember Holden from the Bronx, Councilmember Joni, uh, and from Queens, uh, Councilmember Miller. And I want to open it up to questions right now. If you, you have any questions on, on this side, yeah, Councilmember Holden. Oh, we're gonna put the clock as well for three minutes. First right. round. Okay. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Um, uh, my mom doesn't have a picture ID because she doesn't have a license. Ninety-five years old, mm -hmm. and I just discovered because she's out of her health regular doctors, like the regular doctors that she sees, her doctors. We didn't have to show an ID, picture ID, but when, when she had an accident recently and fell, I had to take her to an emergency room and I didn't have a picture ID. Mm -hmm. So I, I li and, but she's, she's kind of homebound. So I like that you're doing the homebound, but does that, the, the, uh, the, I guess I could find this out without <laughs> asking the commissioner, but I'd like to- but I'm happy actually, to talk about this. I actually, yep. actually like to spread this because this is important. There's a lot of seniors that don't have driver's license. Yeah. Um, and they have to show ID when you go to a uh, health uh, situation. Um, this this uh, mobile unit that co will come to, let's say, our district office or the neighborhoods. I mean, that's, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, so we have a mobile unit, but the homebound unit functions a little bit differently. So if somebody needs a reasonable accommodation because of a disability or age, they can't make their way to an enrollment center, we actually have a team that can go to your home. Um, and oh. they can conduct the enrollment there. And it's been one of, the, one of the more successful new aspects of the program, like the situation of your mother that you described. There are so many New Yorkers who, as we were growing the program, we learned were just unable to physically come to one of our centers. You can just make the request to us, and Sonia, who's joined me, who runs our operations, works with the homebound team to do the scheduling. Okay, now just another question on financial institution is not accepting this. Sure. Um, they do accept a driver's license, most of them that I know. Um, what's the biggest pushback you, are you getting from the ones that are resisting? Uh, other than what your testimony, is there anything <laughs> else we should know? Is there just some that won't do it and they're, they're not really coming up with a good reason for not accepting it? 
Um, so, as I noted, there's been robust conversations, many um, efforts, including receiving guidance at the state and federal levels uh, to um, speak to the ability for banking institutions to accept IDNYC as primary ID. Um, you know, I can't speak directly for individual banks, but I would say that overarchingly, um, there are no other municipal IDs that are accepted across the country. Um, there has been, you know, concerns expressed about their ability to do so, and individual decisions that are made at each individual bank. So um, we are always interested and willing and continuing to engage in these conversations. We consulted with outside um, experts who've worked with federal regulators and others. We even ap approached the Treasury Department um, in these conversations. We are in a new administration, which makes some of these conversations more difficult. So if they, if we, are, the ban are some banks saying, well, there's no chip, there's no uh, real identification, this could, this is, m could be fraudulent in certain areas. Are, are you getting any feedback from the institution saying, this is why we're not accepting it? Are they, or are they just saying no? It, it's mostly based on their risk assessment, but they, it's a new program, they don't expect, accept municipal IDs. There's an unwillingness to, to accept it or to, in, frankly, engage more broadly um, in looking at the populations that we're serving that maybe they're not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, we'll go back to, to second round. Uh, Council Member Trump? Oh, Council Member Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you so much for uh, being here, but also this in important and innovative, uh, I guess we can, Everybody up here on this day is here that had so much to do with it, including Councilman Drum and, and, and for the Chairman Chaka for maintaining the continuity that is necessary to move a good idea. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that Councilman Drum worked on it for a long time and it could have just fell by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So very appreciative of that. And, and it's made a difference in, in so many communities. I do want to kind of double down on and just ensure is, is the, the mobile uh, pop up still? Uh, available, can we uh, kind of bring them into our senior centers once again and, and, and make sure that happens. So that is great. Um, have you, have we found that there are some municipal services um, that we are lacking because of lack of ID somewhere that there are there specifically, specific agencies or services being denied? I know you talked about the MTA, um, which is a monster of his own. Um, but how would that be help to facilitate good transportation options for, for those who've been uh, denied that on the outside? How, how exactly would that work? Because I know specifically um, we've been talking, we, we have a freedom ticket that allows folks in certain parts of uh, New York City to access commuter rail. Um, the problem with that is folks are coming from other places because uh, it, it comes with a, a reduced fare. Mm -hmm. And so we, we see people come from Long Island and other places and, and how is it possible that if not the card, the database could be accessed so that the people who should be using it in the city, uh, marginalized communities, uh, Upper Bronx, Northern Queens, that they can do that. Have we have we coordinated with agencies and specifically um, authorities that that uh, require additional information, as you were saying with the uh, MTA? Um, so I hopefully will have uh, understood your question correctly. But on the question around uh, mobile access and doing the pop-ups, we're still doing all of that. So um, please engage us as. You, you see the need, locations, community locations we can talk to and engage with. Um, we're happy to do that and to follow up. The goal with those things are really to be in locations where we don't have permanent centers so that we're, we're increasing access as much as possible. Um, in terms of other things that you could do with the card or other needs, um, I would say yes. You know, when we started to look at um, 
you know, what are the, the, the different either city services or locations? Oftentimes it's an agency that comes to us. For example, the Department of Health came to us and said, we would like to ensure that all New Yorkers can access the immunization records um, online and we need, uh, you know, an ability for them to do so, but that verifies their ID. So we worked with them to create that integration. We've continued conversations like that with agencies. Often it requires the technology so that the things can communicate with each other, which is why we've been exploring um, the possibility of a smart chip or an additional um, barcode um, that would allow for that. So that's a big intention and part of why we're looking at these things. We just wanna do so responsibly. Um, as it relates to the MTA, the MTA has been in the process of moving towards becoming a contactless system. Um, as I understand it, they've already rolled out in uh, a tester or pilot in some locations. Their plan is to roll out citywide by the end of 2020. Um, and, um, and then to phase out the key card systems. And um, obviously when we, do, when we do our outreach and engagement and we've surveyed card holders, um, the ability to, ha to use the IDNYC as a metro card has been something that's always risen to the top. So when we learned that, we began to look at what would be possible, how would we be able to make that integration work? Um, and the, ab the ability to do so is what we're exploring now through the advent addition of a smart chip with a banking option or um, the smart chip to allow that transaction to happen. We have a lot of questions that we're exploring on what that looks like. Um, the city of Chicago has done this not with the banking function but making a transactional ability with their CTA system. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we're, we are exploring it effectively and that we're looking at the questions that will arise on access to the information. I'd say the city's intention is to not hold any personal information beyond what we hold, which is what's on your card, right? Mm. Um, and that's true for all New Yorkers. That's our commitment to privacy and confidentiality. That's all we would hold in terms of privacy, personal information of card holders. And in terms of eligibility, it would be that you're new, you live in New York and we establish right. residence when we go through the enrollment process for the program. All right, so, so that's great because that, you know, uh, it would definitely help to, for us to reach our target audience, which is all, all New Yorkers and those who certainly in those transportation deserts and, and, and keep out folks who are taking advantage of something that is specifically targeted for, for New York City residents. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Trum. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Good to see you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, let me just start off by asking a little bit about um, the first renewal pro uh, period. So that's gonna come up starting, uh, I guess, less than a year from now. Yes, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to actually begin to do outreach on that before the January or February kickoff date. So what, how would that renewal period, what would that look like? What will you do? Sure, so we're in the beginning of planning and we welcome ongoing conversations on this. I think obviously what we learned from the launch of the program was having robust participation and engagement was really critical to the, to the, to the campaign and to the success of the program. Um, we've started uh, from the kind of nitty gritty weeds of operations and policy and how we would make it work, as I noted in my testimony, particularly building out a system that would make it easier for cardholders. Um, and that we will hopefully be finalizing some recommendations soon and obviously um, briefing partners on what we anticipate there. We're also looking at um, a robust campaign, including marketing and community engagement and outreach, um, and beginning that as early as the fall. Will you mail directly to people? Um, yeah, so one of the things that we're considering doing, but appreciate the feedback, is we have done direct mailers before, um, and we also do a, we do a newsletter for cardholders. I mean like to cardholders that you already have their address yeah. saying that you're yeah. up for renewal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just uh, one of the issues, because yeah. I've seen my time is going so quick, um, that has been of concern is the chip. Yeah. And can you tell me how you envision that chip to be, what type of information that chip would hold, and would it be possible, for example, like if you were to pass by somebody on the street or not, would somebody be able to pick up that information 
or would the chip be handled in such a way that um, like the, um, the documents that we did not keep any longer, but we did at one point keep, be destroyed, or I don't understand exactly what that would look like. So sure. can you just run through that for me? Sure, thank you. So um, I guess a couple of things that, you know, as I noted, and I think I, I could repeat as much as possible today, um, the privacy of cardholders is really core for us. Um, we are in this process. And, and what I'm most concerned about is the security of that. Of course, yeah. and the security of it, exactly. Um, and in part of that, that exploration, what we've been um, trying to best understand is if the addition of the chip, if we were to have the addition of the chip, we wouldn't want any unique cardholder information to be on it. Um, that's the first thing. Um, we also wouldn't want it to be mandatory for New Yorkers. So if I'm a New Yorker and I'm happy with my ID NYC um, as it is, and I don't want to connect it to additional integrations that we would be exploring, I wouldn't have to. Um, and so uh, the things that we are looking at as it relates to the addition of the chip is just one, making sure that there's no personally identifiable unique cardholder information on there. So nothing that connects that to Danny Drum, um, one. Uh, two, that any information that w might be on there to connect to a transaction is also encrypted and can only be read by a vendor. Um, three, that your question on what can get picked up, right? It would be, um, it would have to be a contactless card that can be read by a leader, by a reader. Um, they're globally used. This is the direction that most technology is going in as it relates to payment functionality is the chip because it is safer and it is more secure. Um, and you would have to be at about 10 centimeters to a reader to read it. Um, and these are exactly the right questions to ask. They're exactly what we're in the process of exploring. We're talking to um, chip experts, we're talking to the vendors, we're talking to advocates, we're talking to others to make sure we're doing the due diligence. But of course, central to that is that there wouldn't be unique cardholder information actually on the chip and that you would get to choose whether or not you would even connect it or not. And obviously no indication of uh, immigration status. Of course not, no. You don't even collect that to begin we with. We do not collect that to begin with. Right. Nothing okay. about your documents, nothing about your name, nothing about your address, nothing about that identifies you personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drummond. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna kind of be going uh, deeper into some of these questions about uh, enrollment. And uh, just from like the Twitter world, I wanna just add that there was an idea, we're asking for ideas of folks that are, are not here with us, but are following, somebody wants um, uh, access to Governor's Island for free using your IDNYC, okay? Um, I think there's a lot of excitement for the MTA integration, really exciting. Um, and then, and then th there's just a lot of uh, direct messages saying, I lost mine, okay. how do I get a new one? And some sending them to the website, they can, they can get a, uh, an appointment. And it's really easy, actually. And we yeah. do that in our district offices yep. all the time. Uh, if your address has changed, you can get a new one. Um, how much does it cost to get a new one, by the way? Um, if your address has changed, there's no fee to get a new one. Address change, no fee. No fee. That's exciting. Um, what, what else? If you have lost your card or it was stolen, there's a $10 fee. But if you can't pay it, you can do an attestation to us as for a hardship waiver. Awesome. That's the real commitment. Uh, and uh, I do want to say I did have a conversation with um, uh, Councilmember Kassar from Austin, Texas today, just to check in, hey, where you are. Yeah. Where you, and, and I know you've been working with them too. We're all working with them. Um, and they're not, they're not anywhere there. They're not anywhere near um, uh, launching really because of the climate that we're in right now and, and what Texas is all about. Back to the celebration, stars have really align, aligned here to ensure that we're focused on the values around privacy, protecting our, our New Yorkers uh, at the city level, and hopefully working with our state to ensure that we can, we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the mayor right now is testifying before the, the governor, or the, um, the state, uh, for some of the, some of the um, things that we need here in the city. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the questions that I think are important, and then I'll do another round. The IDNYC quarterly reports uh, detail outreach efforts to seek the Jewish and the African communities 
uh, in the last quarter. How does Moya and the IDEA NYC program rely on data to determine which communities uh, to target outreach on? How, how do you make those decisions? Um, where's that source of data coming from to make those decisions and what are those key indicators? Sure, so when we started the program, we actually started to look at um, data broadly on immigrant dense communities in the city. Um, a lot of that data is uh, worked or looked at by our Office of Economic Opportunity in conjunction with Moya in looking at um, census and ACS uh, survey data um, and uh, distilling from that the communities in which immigrant New Yorkers live, um, the, the demographics or breakdowns of immigrant New Yorkers, the languages they speak, et cetera. Uh, we have a forthcoming Moya report that has updated demographic data on um, the city and immigrant communities um, and it has similarly utilizes um, the data to, to, present, um, to present that information. Um, we use that information in thinking about where we should be engaging. We did so at the start of the program in selecting where permanent enrollment centers would go in looking at where we would do um, targeted or intentional marketing um, and uh, obviously community engagement. And that's an ongoing part of what we do through our outreach um, efforts and initiatives. I think we've certainly honed a few additional things like working with the Department of Education and looking at schools where students, um, you know, might, might be immigrant dense schools where it would be beneficial for, for us to go and do the enrollment there. Um, we have uh, worked with our community partners, where as I noted, we don't have permanent enrollment sites and easy access to provide um, pop-up enrollment centers or also just understanding how different communities engage. So often some communities might be less willing to even go to the local library, but if you were to set up a pop-up enrollment site at, for example, the Sherpa Association, we had an incredible experience there. Um, and community really came out in droves to, to enroll. So um, a lot of different things inform it, including what would we hear from you all, um, that there is a need, um, and we continue to assess where we should be and where we need to be, but also obviously now have a few years of experience in kind of understanding what has worked and what hasn't. Is there an enrollment goal for the administration? I mean, are we at like 100%? We wanna go 100%? What's your goal? Um, you know, I think our goal is, as it has been in the last couple of years, is just to ensure that we are continuing a robust engagement. We have not exhausted our efforts around marketing. We did a marketing campaign last year and um, looked at um, messaging and received feedback through focus groups that targeted populations where we thought maybe we were not seeing as much um, interest or uptick, um, and also adjusting things like the advent of a homebound unit where we knew we weren't effectively serving a certain population, working closely with the Department of Homeless Services. Every, almost every year since the program, we've promulgated a new rule and that's been our assessment from really learnings from our staff of what people are coming into our enrollment centers with um, and looking at what documents we don't accept and maybe we should and seeing if we can reliably and securely accept them. So. I think the goal for us has always been accessibility. The goal for us has always been to be responsive to communities. The goal for us has been to not sort of rest on our laurels with enrollment, but to be proactive and intentional in ensuring that we're reaching New Yorkers in, in myriad ways. Got it, so no numbers, it's more mission driven. Yeah. And as you gain more perspective, is there any need for capacity like rethinking capacity for IDNYC as you open up these pockets of access for communities? Do you have a capacity issue? Are you anticipating capacity issues? Sure, um, you know, we're certainly assessing any needs that we have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a renewal period coming up um, and um, the importance of making sure given the sheer volume of cardholder enrollment in the first year that we can effectively address that. Um, I would say that um, the mayor and OMB have always been responsive um, and quick to ensure that the program has what it needs to, to meet capacity and demand. And so what reactions at the NYC program are you seeing on the ground? Uh, 
in terms of favoring and then those who have had issues and have not been able to enroll um, or just kind of tell you through, you mentioned the survey, but through your staff, texture of, of folks who are saying, I will not sign on to this card in, in say, protest versus those who are saying, yes, this is an exciting program, we're in favor of the program. Can you, can you give us a little bit of both of those? Um, sure. I don't know that I really readily hear the negative. Um, okay. I mean, that's an I, answer too, right? Yeah. I don't know. We're going to be asking the advocates that, so we'll, we'll come back to that. But from um, you and your point of view. I mean, I think always, and this, this we don't anticipate changing, right? Always a part of this has been ensuring that um, we can confidently speak to um, the security, the privacy, the... Um, you know, the city's commitment to defending those things and to upholding them. I think that has always been a part of what we've done as a program and will always be necessary. So certainly I think, uh, you know, people sort of wondering what happens to my information, right? And us being responsive and able to communicate that and what the city's laws set out, um, what the executive orders are on privacy, both data storage and disclosure set out, and our continued commitment to upholding all of that. Um, I think in terms of um, other, you know, we have not seen a lot of other negative, and I'm just going to leave it there because I think that's a good thing. And then <laughs> the other, on the positive front, um, I would say, you know, lots of people, obviously, we live in a city where a lot of New Yorkers don't have ID, um, they don't have driver's licenses. Um, that was something that we learned, you know, early on in looking at the program. We've also intentionally looked at this program as a way to address additional gaps. You know, trust presenting a document with N to NYPD that doesn't have any immigration status or information on it, ability to enter your child's school, ability to access banking, really central to the inception of IDNYC in the city of uh, New Haven was the reality that many undocumented workers were getting paid in cash and were being subject to, frankly, robberies. And it was because they were carrying that cash and their inability to access banking in, a, in an effective way that the city determined that it needed to create access to banking and one way to do that was to create an ID that they could be eligible for to use to open an account. So um, we, in surveying cardholders, there were two things that rose to the top in terms of challenges. One was banking access and the other was financial transactions with the card. Uh, council members, questions? Uh, council council just, member Drum. Sure, thank you, Chair. Just as a, a follow up, um, I mean, one of the things that I've always been interested in ever since I sponsored, along with Council Member Menchaca, the legislation was the ability for um, unbanked folks to be able to uh, bank with it. Mm -hmm. And um, not only that, but as you mentioned, with check cashing places in particular. Um, it would be so much better if folks could have direct deposit into some type of a financial institution. Um, and um, and, and I'm, I, I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that you're moving in that direction. Is that correct? I think we've always shared that goal with you, right? Um, recognizing that in our city there are es estimates of hundreds of thousands of unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers, many of whom are subject to predatory practices. We've learned that as, as much as we celebrate the existing partners we've had, we've heard they're not in every community, there continue to be banking deserts, people want a, 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 a location near them or ability to access, access financial services in an easier way. Um, that's why we're continuing to explore this. It is mandated through the law, right, that we continue to look at banking access. Um, we early on made the determination that we would not do this um, if there were predatory practices or fees associated with it. That remains true in this exploration. We've requested that any entity that would propose to us list up front all of the fees that anybody might ever be subject to so that there would be transparency, list up front all the privacy and security considerations, um, and we will continue to do, do due diligence in evaluating those. So is, is it, w would you then go into like a coordinated effort to go with one financial institution or with several that meet the criteria? Because like 
if I go to Citibank, you know, it's three dollars. But if I go to um, the corner bodega and I want to take money out of a, uh, uh, you know, from an ATM, it's like a dollar seventy-five or whatever. How, do, you, do you have any idea about how that piece of it would work? So I guess I would say a few things. So it, we w we've been working closely with the Office for Financial Empowerment and also studying and speaking to experts who have looked into um, financial access broadly and kind of understanding what makes somebody go one place versus another and why with our existing partners what have been some of the challenges despite creation of a banking guide for them, the marketing campaigns, et cetera. Um, in, in some of that thinking, it has been, access has been a big one. Um, so a lot of people do go to their bodega, right? They do go to uh, the neighborhood supermarket or what have you, and that is actually where they do some of their financial transactions. So one of the things we've been asking is essentially, how would you create access points there without having exorbitant fees, right? Um, we have asked could you link your existing banking account? We have a asked, would you have multiple partners? I think we're in at the stage still where we're receiving information to evaluate, but we are interested in questions that people have um, and ensuring that we're exploring things effectively. Uh, since the chair hasn't told me to stop, I'll ask her one last question. Go for it. Thank you. Um, have you ever done a study? I know that the Department of Consumer Affairs did a study on immigrant financial services, but has Moya ever done a study uh, on that? We have not done a study through Moya. M all of the work on banking access that this program has looked at and that Moya has looked at has been in partnership with the Office for Financial Empowerment. So obviously they are the city's um, agency that is charged with ensuring consumer protections and non-predatory practices and have the expertise. So we believe in and are working closely with them to inform this. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna follow up, uh, Council Member John, with your question, because in 2013, the city's Department of Consumer Affairs released a study uh, on immigrant financial services, which details the financial habits of select groups of immigrant New Yorkers. Then the report compares the financial habits of banked, unbanked, underbanked immigrant New Yorkers. Um, and, and so uh, Councilmember Drum asked whether or not you all have conducted that analysis. Um, that was six years old, I think, right? And it's, it's, it's a favorite document of ours, by the way. We, we like going back to that. Uh, maybe the advocates like it too. Yeah, okay, some, there was some nodding over there. Um, so back again, is that, is that something that, that is possible to do? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll think of ways that we can compel you to do that on our side, but is that, before we get there, how, how are you thinking of updating that? Um, I'm happy to talk with them further about any plans that they might have in doing so and thinking about how best to update that information. Thank you. It's just a rich document, yeah. data analysis, and yeah. our, our data gurus here love that. Great. Uh, Councilmember Holman. Hey, just a, a couple of quick follow-ups. Um, since I do have so many seniors without picture ID, and I've heard that, um, and if I schedule something, you'll, you'll come out to my district and obviously do that. Um, but can I get a, um, a count of how many ID holders I have in my district? So I, I could um, actually address that with, in my newsletter or we, we can get that? Sure, um, we, can, we have zip code data and we can work with you to come up with the right estimate, yeah. Right, so I, yeah, so I could focus on reaching out to them. Because I, I believe in this because I run into so many problems with um, no picture ID, especially for my mom. And um, she used to have something, and I forget, it, it might have lapsed through the Department of Motor Vehicles with non-driver's license. They actually give an ID, but I think I had to renew that and I, she probably lost it, but right. I remember seeing it. Um, and that seemed to work, but it doesn't, you know, I don't have that anymore. Also, other than what you mentioned in your testimony, um, what other institutions are not accepting this, this card that should, other than we mentioned financial, some pharmacies, right? Um, uh, do you have any other glaring ones that you can't understand why they're not accepting this? Um, well, we, I mentioned the state as well, which we the do state, understand yes, why, yeah. and, and um, that is on our agenda. Right. Um, 
Um, others that don't accept it that should, none, none are rising to my attention, but it's probably because the ones that have are the ones that we hear the most right. <laughs> um, and are trying to look at. We, we've obviously heard that it can't be used for purchasing of alcohol or tobacco. Um, I'm getting a note, so maybe there are others. Um, and, um, and that's something that um, is also sort of state dictated. So if somebody walks in and wants, and they're 35 years old, obviously, and they want to purchase alcohol, they can't by showing that ID? I didn't know that. It Tell me one more time. If you're, you're, you want to purchase alcohol at a, at a or let's say beer, and you have to show an ID, it's not accepted now? Um, because what, it doesn't list the age or? Um, because it's state controlled law that says what ID documents can be accepted. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure people have tried. Sure. Council Member Jones. No, it presents a problem even when you enter or try to go into a bar like on Roosevelt Avenue or whatever, um, people have been uh, told that that's not proper identification. So yeah. it remains an issue and, and also says that we still need to work on um, getting driver's licenses for our immigrant communities. So it's the ultimate goal. Um, my question is really uh, about uh, the timeline to implement uh, the um, renewal process and the, the CHIP process. Are they connected um, and uh, were you hoping to do uh, one with the other or separate from the other or, or what, what does that look like at this point? Sure, so we are still in the exploratory process with um, the CHIP and with potentially adding a banking function. Um, I think we ha we do not have an end date for that, right? That's just beginning, so we don't have an end date for when that will happen. Um, certainly, we're starting to make decisions around the renewal period. We have 11 months um, bet before the renewal period begins, and if they were to align, great. <laughs> um, but the the process is underway and does not have a timeline attached to it. We want to get it right if we do it, so that's really the priority. Good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Jones, for that question, and we'll come back to that. Uh, we'll circle back to that. Um, but there's some data, more data question uh, questions. Uh, the program did go under, and you mentioned it in your testimony, the evaluation in 2016 uh, based on 2015 data. Uh, that is available on the IDNYC website. Uh, does the program anticipate conducting another all-encompassing encompassing program evaluation soon uh, when you have the kind of data that you have right now with 100, what, with 1.25 million people? Yeah, um, we've, we've talked about what, you know, what would be helpful in terms of um, additional information. As I said, we do pretty robustly and fairly regularly engage with cardholders and New Yorkers around the card, um, and and again, what's working and what isn't. You guys often elevate things to us as you're hearing them. So um, I think it's definitely not off the table. It's something that we would consider, and certainly as we're moving <coughs> towards renewal, we want to kind of have many different ideas on what to, how best to inform that. And this is really connected to Danny's question, uh, uh, Councilmember Drum's question about this this kind of coordination with not just the chip, but really anything that's new as as we look to renewal, we need to tell the story in a fuller way. And uh, mine expires on the 19th of January of 2020. And you're going to you're going to have to make the case to me to renew. Um, and so I want to I want to be Hopefully compelled you'll be to do that. Fruit. But I, I don't represent all the cardholders. And so every cardholder yeah. holds a very different kind of connection to this card for different reasons. And so this is an important one. And I, and I think that we want to compel you yet again on another set of, of data that can be available, not just to you, but to the advocates, so that we can all look at the same data and make our cases as we get closer to re-enrollment. That has to happen, that conversation needs to happen earlier. And I'm not gonna, uh, we're, we wanna wait for you. If you have some kind of sense about how you're thinking about strategy, if you're asking me as the chair of the Immigration Committee, I'm thinking summertime. Um, I'm thinking about like MTA, um, and fair fares, and so how, how are we getting the message out to people? Uh, and that has been difficult and challenging, uh, not something that, that it falls on you at all, uh, but it falls under the administration. 
And so, um, oh, that's actually maybe on VSS's side. And like, how are we learning from those kind of things that, that, can, that can shape our discussion? How far back do we have to start talking to people about this card and even tell them that there's an expiration date? They might not even see that on their card. Sure. Um, yeah. I don't know if HRA or DSS has, has, a, has a kind of comment about that, um, especially as we're challenged by the out rollout of, of fair fairs right now. So I'll start um, by saying a few things. One is um, that I would just remind you that the survey that we conducted from 2016 encompasses the first year and a half plus of cardholders, right? So um, in terms of who we're talking about for renewal periods, we do know actually why they got the card, how they've been utilizing it, and what their challenges have been. Um, and that is definitely critical to the thinking. We've also consistently done newsletters in terms of updates to cardholders on benefits access, and we have a sense of where people are actually going to utilize their benefits and where they aren't, um, what's working and what isn't. We had the idea, of, of course, of direct mailing um, information to the cardholder well in advance of the renewal period so that they know that the card is going to expire and that they can be responsive to it is huge. As I noted, we do plan to do a marketing campaign, community engagement as we have before, um, including you know engaging the press, using the community and ethnic media, getting the word out, various tactics, but we're open to all ideas and suggestions from you all. Um, and work obviously working with DSS and, and, and the work that they do in, in getting information out as effectively as we can. Um, I'd say, you know, we are lucky in that many of our enrollment centers, all of them, are in high trafficked areas and communities. We have robust outreach engagement um, in the areas, making sure that people are aware of the program. We will both continue to do those efforts, but obviously escalate them in advance of the renewal so people are aware of the renewal process coming up, but also how, about how, to, how to access it. And as I noted, some of that is just how do we make it easier, right? If, you, if none of your information has changed, can we make it simple for you to enroll? And those are the things that we're thinking through now and should have updates on soon. And I just want to give an opportunity for Ms. Daly to to say anything uh, from DSS's point of view? I mean, just to be clear, she runs IDNYC operations. So her expertise is really okay. IDNYC operations. I, okay. And should not be there anybody here that can answer the to. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, thank you for your work, Sonia Daly of the DSS team at IDNYC. Councilmember Drum. Thank you. Just again, um, uh, uh, online registration, re-registration. Is that something that you're considering? Yes. So like I, I wanted to, I just did my um, car registration. I'm sorry you don't drive carless, but uh, I do and I have a car. <laughs> so I was able to do all of that online. Is that something that you're gonna be able to do? That is something that we're considering. As you know, we have an incredible technology team that has actually changed the application process, making it easier for people to go through the majority of the process already online. So that's a big part of what we've been developing um, and we'll have more to share soon. Great, I, I'm gonna have to leave because I have to go to a meeting, but I do wanna thank you. And, uh, and I thank you also for emphasizing that security moving forward is going to be the really defining thing in terms of any decisions that we make. And just, just I wanna say thank you for that being one yeah. of your top concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drummond. Look forward to partnering with you from our um, different different positions and but shared commitment and values. Yeah. Councilmember Holden, did you have any other? No, good. Okay, so in preparation for this rollout, as we continue to talk about it, uh, Moya IDNYC published uh, its language and disability access plan. Mm -hmm. And this was on January 2nd, 2015. How has Moya and IDNYC updated its plan to reflect the Local Law 30 of 2017? Yeah, so thanks. So um, IDNYC always went beyond the Local Law uh, Executive Order at the time and now Local Law 30. So. Been always, has always been. Yes. Yep. 
Um, so when we rolled out the initial um, materials for the program, we had a multilingual brochure, but we also included in that brochure, um, due to space considerations, right, a list of additional languages that were available up to 25. Um, languages for materials. We've also, since in working with different communities, identified languages that we didn't have documents or applications translated into and have then produced those documents in different languages. All of our staff has access to interpretation services for up to 200 languages. Um, so we... Is that language line? Yes. Okay. Yes, I believe. Um, I can confirm that, but I think that is the contract language line. Um, and obviously one of the you know, key and important uh, aspects of our diverse staff is that they speak many different languages. And so we're very conscious of putting folks who speak the languages of communities in the right locations. And that's a big part of what this woman does um, in terms of scheduling our staff and making sure we're meeting the needs. But um, I'm happy to say that the program is indeed an example of a robust language access um, plan and program in the way that it operates and it exceeds the requirements of local authority. Well, and so I'm thinking a little bit about what you just said and you're going above and beyond. You have a language and disability access plan. You're saying IDNYC goes above and beyond. Is that the case for across the board on Moya initiatives or is it just special to IDNYC? Um, it's generally true for all of our initiatives that we are going beyond the 10. It depends on the initiative, right? Of course, if we're working where we're particularly targeting a certain community or our intention is to communicate a message to a certain community, for example, right now we have a massive anti-fraud campaign on phone scams for the Chinese community. So we're being intentional in terms of the translation of those documents. Um, but our approach is always to, um, you know, shoot for the best to make sure that when we're doing outreach and engagement, we are going above and beyond in terms of um, translation and information. We also advise, as you know, other agencies on this and support them in, in translation and interpretation services. We conduct trainings in different languages. So um, IDNYC is the largest program that we, we initiate and operate, but it's also the lens in which we apply what we do with Action NYC and others. And how about the, the component around disability and access for, uh, for, for that community, specifically for IDNYC? Yes, so um, all of our permanent enrollment centers are ADA accessible. Um, and Every single one? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, we, though, despite that and despite sort of ensuring that we have, we, you know, we've been very well advised by the Mayor's Office for um, Physical Disability as well as um, the, the experts at HRA and DSS on this over the years. Um, and as I noted earlier, what we came to learn was despite that ADA accessibility, there were still significant challenges due largely to the needs of homebound individuals. So that was why we developed the homebound equipment, which our team did, which was incredible, um, and allows for the ability to actually visit somebody's home and do the enrollment um, entirely on site. And the report states that there's annual reports that are compiled for on-site telephonic bilingual assistance and written tra translation. Are those online for people to review? And these are annual annual reports, not quarterly. I don't think so. I will look though and get back to you. Okay. Um, and and what we want to do is really I know we put the quarterly reports online, but I'm not sure if we do those. And. We're just trying to figure out how they're different from IDNYC since this is a more robust and it sounds like there's a lot of resources and a lot more commitment by IDNYC. So it'd be good to kind of see how they, they compare. Um, on topic of banking, so has Moya or IDNYC conducted focus groups to determine the needs of IDNYC cardholders as it relates to the financial services? This is kind of like a beginner question, but we're going to go back there and just, just start at the beginning. Have you conducted these? Sure. Um, what we're gonna call focus groups or what have you conducted to get a, get a sense about what the financial services needs are. Sure, so um, I think 
again, coming into the birth of the program, this is a shared goal from the council, the administration. And just so we can be clear, we're talking about the law itself compels the city yes. to execute on financial services and access to civilian financial that's, services. So that's yeah. what we're all referring to right Ongo now. On an ongoing basis. On an ongoing basis. Yes. Okay. Um, and um, we did, uh, shortly after the uh, program's launch, um, a broader survey and just sort of understanding um, uh, the need there and the sort of compelling nature of having that access through the card. Um, we um, then conducted the survey, as you know, we have throughout the program conducted different focus groups, particularly on uh, messaging and marketing and understanding what was um, of interest to card holders, what would be compelling and convincing in getting the card and what should be things that we should look at adding. Um, banking was a component that came up particularly for young people, which is why earlier on in ads we actually focused um, the messaging around access to banking for young folks. Um, and we, you know, we've continued to engage in, in uh, that conversation and feedback loop with cardholders, including the 2016 survey. So um, we are always willing and interested in having these conversations. We, though I would say largely know beyond our cardholders, and certainly this is again the expertise of the Office for Financial Empowerment, that again there are hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that are unbanked or underbanked. Um, this is not a new phenomena, this is a real phenomena, and part of the goal of this program has been to look at how you can help address that reality and how you can move people away from predatory uh, financial services to ones that work for them, recognizing, as you noted, that people access financial services in different ways. So that has been a central goal of the program, it is, I believe, our responsibility and our mandate from the local law to continue to look at this. There are different experiences that different people have in terms of what makes it so that you go to a bank or you don't. That's part, part of that research is what we've been looking at as well um, through research uh, that, uh, per, um, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but experts have done on um, un, the unbanked and why they're unbanked um, and what compels people to move towards accessing financial services. There's no, I think, secret that, of course, we're in a moment in time in our own society in which easy ease of access um, is key to people's uh, kind of taking that next step in engaging, and you're seeing that innovation in a lot of ways. I think it's incumbent upon us to look at that, but to do so responsibly if we move forward. Well, and, and so I, I guess what I, I just want to, before I get to the next question, um, is there a sense of, of, of the groups, how many times, so the, the, the quantitative data on, did you do this once, did you do, the, are you doing this once a month, uh, who is part of this group, uh, and give us the kind of science data. I can get back to you on like the number of times okay. we've engaged different cardholders in different That's totally ways. fine. Yeah. We'll follow up on that, on that front. In 2016, Moya reported that IDNYC, uh, Moya and the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Financial Empowerment partner to pr promote NYC free tax prep with a financial partner. Uh, since that report, what events or consumer education has Moya IDNYC conducted to help the unbanked achieve greater financial security? What was the, I, well, I don't remember the date that you noted, but can you repeat 2016. it? 2016. 2016, so yeah. since 2016, I believe, we actually did a marketing campaign with DCA on banking access um, and included things like um, you know, cups at a local bodega that kind of gave the information and connected people. We've since, um, we, we developed the banking guide for cardholders and so now all cardholders get that in terms of um, uh, the gu guide to banking with your IDNYC and financial empowerment. So we've certainly been committed to ongoing education and ideas on how best to expand both people's awareness of how to use the card, but also um, who the partners are and how to engage in that way. Um, we have been in conversations with DSA, DCA for this year around the free tax prep um, and work that we can do together to promote that. Are they, are they conducting their own studies on this as well? 
um, we're doing we're conducting shared promotion of it. Okay. Um, That's what I meant. Okay. To the program evaluation in 2016, one improvement highlighted is to create additional specific guidance for cardholders about banking itself. Yes. And so while IDNYC is accepted as a primary form of identification at several financial institutions, it is currently not accepted as a form of primary ID at several larger banks, which remains a source of confusion for some, yeah. probably maybe all cardholders. We've also heard that some of the staff at the banks that accept IDNYC are not aware that it can be used as a primary ID. We get, I get, we get this at the district office a lot. It's like, do something about it. And so how are you, what are you doing about that and working with the financial institutions to ensure that there's good um, information recognized appropriately across the board from the higher ups of the bank at, and the tellers at the front? Yeah, so some of the progress that has been made since then is um, while the, you know, re the guidance that we receive tells the banks that they can they can accept IDNYC. They have to make their own determination. Um, uh, they, while there's been reticence to accept it as primary ID, we have gotten acceptance as ID, for IDNYC as secondary ID across national banking partners. So, um, which has been an improvement, including the larger um, national banks like Chase and Bank of America and City and others. Um, our, one of our goals with that was exactly this, right, is ensuring that if they are at least accepting it as secondary, it becomes something that becomes a part of the training and informing of their staff of what the ID is and how to communicate on it. We've continued to engage with individual banks um, that we learn about that might have interest or that people bring to us as banks that we should be engaging with that we haven't yet or looking at banks in communities where we have a lot of cardholders and proactively engaging. And as I noted, just this last um, month, we added an additional banking partner. So there is some fruit to that labor and we'll continue to do that. So what is the biggest barrier from moving to primary ID acceptance for, for banks? I mean, I think this is the question that Council Member Holden was asking, and of course, as I said, I can't speak for the banks, but it's an individual bank determination. But what is the quality of that that decision? Do you know? The quality of the, it? Yeah, like what, what, what are they saying to you? And it might be different for every bank, but what are the banks telling you? Um, I think it, it is coming down to their comfort level, frankly, because the regulation says that they can, but they must make their own determination. Okay. Okay. So in May, uh, do that. You have any you more questions? I, I've dealt with banks, even on with with your campaigns. When you want to open a campaign accounts, there are some banks that just won't. Most of the banks won't won't even open one for you. So it's like you're you're, you're talking about give campaign, you a reason. You're talking about campaign accounts for you. That no, no, for any for any for any uh, accounts any elected. It, it's like okay. they just say we that's our policy they'll they'll say things like that which they don't explain so I understand Got the it. barriers for that yes that any any account that they you have to go to Brooklyn then we'll, 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 we'll opening up lots of accounts <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> find away. yeah you could I could only find one in Queens the entire and it was you know not convenient but this is what banks oh. say yeah. right so I understand that I understand that's our policy. Many many institutions do that, but especially financial institutions. And so. even existing partners, you know, this has again been a goal for us is to have wide access regardless of status. And some partners have said they require a social security number. So barriers exist in different ways. Um, and I think that's part of our responsibility to continue to look at how we break those down and increase banking access. Y yeah, I just think it's, it's new and they're not familiar with it or they just yep. they have these strict policies like i said then they haven't reached out and they'll only recognize this this and this as id valid id so you you really i think the longer it's out there i think more institutions like you said will accept it so well, it sounds like we're pushing them too and that's important in May 2018, the IDNYC program, along with the mayor's office of the chief technology officer, released a request for information, RFI, application for proposals to expand the utility of the current IDNYC card into a card with a smart chip capable of storing money and or being linked with a bank account. You mentioned this in your testimony. Can you describe the origin of this RFI? How was this decision made to explore creating a municipal banking card informed 
by data or qualitative research. Sure. Let's get back to some of the origins of this conversation. Sure. So um, I think origin story you've now heard me talk about a lot just in terms of the, the goal and desire to ensure that we're looking at financial services um, and increasing access for cardholders, the work that we've done in communities through our survey, through additional focus groups in looking at how to better do this, the work that we did to try to increase awareness and access of existing partners and still seeing um, this as number one challenges that we'd heard from cardholders. So um, we began in 2017 to talk to um, different consultants around banking and um, financial uh, transaction accounts and how you could link the two, understanding if this would be something at all possible to do with the IDNYC card. When we had started the program, we looked at um, financial access options and frankly, the, the fees that were available to consumers were too great, um, something that the city was not willing to pass on to cardholders um, or New Yorkers as a whole. That was not the goal, was to have exorbitant fees, but to reduce the fees for individuals who were getting access to financial services. Um, our, in our research, we'd seen that some of these um, options had, had evolved, frankly, from 2014 um, further, but we still were, it was still unclear to us um, who, who could even possibly as an entity do something like this and do so in a way that addressed all of the concerns that we laid out from fees to privacy and security to consumer education and so forth. Um, we, in that conversation, as we rightly should, engaged the chief technology officer because this would be something that would require technology advent. Um, they recommended that we issue this RFI through their challenge platform, which was exactly designed to say, if this is a challenge, what could any entity do to be responsive to it to meet the needs? Um, so that is why we did it this way. It didn't obligate us to do anything. It allowed us to invite actual entities to tell us how they would address the concerns. Which entities? If you can say, and, and I'm thinking about privacy people, technology people, consumer protection people, financial service experts, regulators, et cetera. Sure. Um, so throughout the process, as I said, the CTO's office, the chief, pri chief privacy officer, um, our vendor, consumer protection institutes, um, uh, experts on the unbanked, um, and when we decided that we wanted to do the exploration, um, we of course, as we have with every um, additional uh, effort that we've done with the program, we briefed council members, we briefed advocates and community groups to get feedback and to understand how folks felt. We noted, of course, that the reason that we were doing this was because we didn't actually know if anybody could actually do what we were saying. <laughs> um, and the goal was to be able to, to make an educated decision on whether or not we would even want to do something like this. Um, we're still in that process. We were happy with some of what we saw. We gave folks updates in the late summer, early fall, but we couldn't actually do a no robust conversation without going through an additional process. So that's what we're in now. And that's the notice of intent? Yes. Okay. And the New York State Department of Financial Services, did you connect with them at all uh, as part of your stop along the way? Um, for sure, in terms of the state regulatory guidance that we received and an ongoing conversations there, we also engaged just to understand sort of the, not the financial services folks, but the, um, uh, I don't actually know the department, to understand the, the plans for the contactless Metro card system and how it would work and what would be compatible if we were looking at that. DCA has the Office of Financial Empowerment. D were they part of your team as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so on and December- And continue to be. Say that again? I said and continue to be. And continue to be, yeah, they're your, your partner. On December 14, 2018, DSS, as the procuring agency, released a notice of intent that uh, we just mentioned uh, to solicit applications and to host and execute a payment of banking feature on a dual interface smart chip on the IDNYC card, and that's the language that we're pulling from the notice of intent. Can you relay in any specific terms as you can without compromising the current negotiations, because that's not what we want to do at all, what capabilities IDNYC is hoping to include in the card, what are the privacy protections? I think this is what people are concerned about, um, sure. and, and the conversation is out there. 
um, and then the general parameters related to the fees and accessibility and the consumer protections, the outreach, the education, the program. I think it's important. You mentioned it in the, you mentioned it in the, um, when you no, uh, hint at the notice, but it'd be good to give you that opportunity right now. Um, and, and there's so many people here I'm looking at that are partners in this and have made 1.0 so yeah. exciting yep. and ce celebratory. Yep. That I think it's important for them to hear right now from from you. For sure, and I and I would you know I would know of course that um, so much of what we're trying to do is we know as we did with the program itself be innovative and smart and bold about how you reach communities and how you make something work for them. And I think this exploration has been no different in, in its process and in its intention. So as you see laid out in the notice of intent. Um, we are asking for what information would have to be on the card, what information could not be on a card. We're asking for all privacy protections. We're asking for how they would store data. We're asking for when they would disclose it, what their legal obligations are, ways that the city could be informed if they received a subpoena so that the city could intervene if necessary, how they would hi hide IDNYC cardholder identities, right? We're asking for robust access through language access that complies with our local laws. We're asking for uh, the, a layout of all of the access points that people would have, all of the fees that they might be subject to, um, and as we know, often are hidden. We're asking for those to be fully disclosed to the city before any determination could be made. We're asking a robust series of questions, including how you would go about consumer education and outreach, knowing that any entity, our existing banking partners, our existing museum partners, that a cardholder goes to, that a New Yorker goes to, ha is subject to its own policies around privacy and security. We wanna make sure that anything that you would do here would have transparency for the individual that would choose, again, opt in to engage in it. Um, and make a decision that is informed completely and that they can independently make using their judgment. We would not share cardholder information unless there was a consent of a cardholder to do so. We would not ask for cardholder information. So, you know, so much of the thinking that has gone into this has been the thinking that predated the card, the ongoing thinking that we do as a program around privacy and security. We welcome and appreciate the concerns that are raised and the questions that are being asked. They will make us stronger in any decision making um, and we'll continue to be engaged in those conversations so that we're critically thinking about all the right ways to ensure that New Yorkers, yes, they're protected, but they're also informed about their, their rights and abilities. They're also given options on how they can engage with financial services or other access points with their IDNYC card, and we are trying to address a, a hugely challenging issue that has been unaddressed, which is how you move unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers towards financial services. Thank you, and and I think that's something that maybe maybe some advocates understand well, but now everyone can understand if you're listening at home um, right now. Which is important, and we want to get to them. So, and and you've been you've been testifying for some time now. So, I want to I want to leave you with the final thing, which is really outside of IDNYC as we understand it, and the more recent connection to healthcare and really the HHC pieces. Yes. Um, the mayor is talking about this new plan um, that I don't even think we've gotten briefed on on the the new health plan. He was like on CNN yesterday talking about it. I was like, I don't even know about it. Let's talk about it. Um, but uh, is this smart chip going to interact with this concept that the mayor is talking about that really is not his idea, it's the community's idea, this is what the community has kind of been pushing for as well, um, and like smart cities or like what other initiatives does, does the notice of intent and the technology that you're thinking about connect to? Yeah, thanks for the question. So. Um, some of this is a little cart before horse, if I'm to be honest, right? Um, we did do, you know, explorations and kind of understanding what's possible. And as I said, sometimes it's agencies coming to us saying, we'd like to do X, Y, or Z, can you, can you do that? Sometimes it's us going to agencies saying, hey, we know you're doing this thing, um, maybe IDNYC can have a role. Um, we think there's a world of things that we can do. This, the challenge, of course, being that we're limited 
from in, a, in the way that things operate. Things have to um, have information on them. They have to be able to communicate with each other. We don't want to do anything that compri that compromises cardholder information. We've always maintained that any sharing of information must be by the consent of the cardholder. All of that would have to remain true. So. Um, in conversations around NYC care or anything else which we are engaged in, um, we are looking at pros and cons. What does the card need to have for a potential enrolling in that program? Is that something that makes sense for an IDNYC or not? Got it. And so we want to follow up with that. And I'd love, um, I, it probably is not going to be your program. I don't think, are you connected to this NYC mayor thing that he's talking about on CNN? If you're speaking about NYC Care, the health care I don't know program? What it, I don't know what it's called, but um, it's about health care to everybody. Yes. Yes, we are a part of the working group that is you working are. on okay. this. You are, okay. Can you commit to a briefing to me so I could learn a little yes. bit more about it? Awesome. And and the last thing on Twitter that I got as an as a idea was more museums, more museums, more museums. Um, and so more museums, more museums. So that's from them to you, through me. Happily, Thank you, Commission. Oh wait, one last thing. There was one last thing. Um, you said something about storing data and that we understand very clearly on the city. Um, the bank institutions have their own policy as we discussed. So do we have a sense about, do you have a sense right now about what data they collect already and that you kind of already understand it's gonna be a sticky point or a mo place of negotiation? Sure. What do they, what do they, hold? Um, so we we understand and obviously are being advised through lawyers, lots of lawyers, what, what legal obligations they have in terms of data retention and um, disclosures. And then beyond that, we've asked entities to share with us what their policies are um, so that, again, we can e either make determinations that um, allow us to negotiate for better protections for our cardholders or make the determination that that's not secure enough and we wouldn't engage in a contract. So to be continued, but you understand that they have requirements yes. and you're going to have to make some decisions later about what that is with the goals that we talked about here on privacy, protecting our, our New Yorkers as the first, um, yes. as the goal. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner, to both of you. Okay. Um, Ms. Daly, and thank you for your work that you do, and thank you to all of Moya for the preparation that you made for this hearing, and I hope that y your team is gonna stay for the rest of the conversation. There will be folks that thank stay. Thank you all for your yeah. patience, yeah. Um, and thank you. I'll just end by thanking everybody. This is indeed, it takes a village kind of program, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of partners from you know the myriad up to 40, uh, cultural institution partners to the many agencies that contribute to the thinking of this to the robust list of experts internally and externally that we rely on on every aspect of this program I don't think any of that is possible without all of those voices as you started this hearing and noting that this is this is truly a program that embodies that that whole spirit of ensuring that people are engaged in the process, that remains something that we're committed to, and I think that still means that we can do really innovative and bold things with the program. Amen to that, and I'll just add the ethnic press as well. That has been so, I think, critical in getting the word out yep. to communities through, um, through, their, through their work. So thank you to the ethnic media. Uh, thank you, Thanks. Commissioner. And we are now moving toward the, or, did I just? Okay, next panel, we're gonna have up here a group of advocates. Uh, we're gonna the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Sophia Genovese, uh, the Immigrant Defense Project, Missouri Zayla, um, Betsy Plum, New York Immigration Coalition, Jonathan Str uh, Strip Stribling Us, the New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, Kinjal Patel from Staten Island, LSNYC, Thank you for your patience again, and I hope I hope you're um, we're still. I hope everyone who's wanting to testify can testify. If there's somebody in the room that wants to testify, that's from the public, uh, that is compelled, that wasn't compelled before, uh, please sign up using these sheets with the Sergeant of Arms. 
Um, and then put public as well, because I want to I want to hear from public members as well. Um, if you're not part of an organization that is being represented today during uh, during this public hearing. And um, we're going to use the clock four minutes, and then we're going to go back into some Q and A. I, and if you could, uh, because we have your testimony, if there's anything that you want to do to kind of respond to some of the words that the administration gave, uh, anything that's really at the critical point um, of discussion here as we move forward with the um, with the program, both on the celebration side and kind of really advocating for for what it is, and and we just heard now from the future of this program as well. We'll start with you. Uh, make sure that you press the button. It's red. If it's red, place it as close as you can to you, and then you can go. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, my name is Kinjal Patel. I am an attorney from um, Staten Island Legal Services. I work in the LGBTQ HIV Advocacy Unit. Legal Services New York City is the largest provider of free civil legal services in the country with offices in all five boroughs serving 80,000 New Yorkers annually. Thank you to the committee and the council for this opportunity to testify regarding the IDNYC program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Lizney applauds the city's IDNYC program. Um, I won't mention all the benefits that the IDNYC program has conferred on many New Yorkers because we just heard about that for the past hour. Um, so uh, while New York City is a leader in immigrant inclusivity and began the NYD, IDNYC program with undocumented immigrants, along with other segments of our community in mind, we remind the city council that there is always more work to be done in striving to protect our immigrant communities, we must continuously ask what else can be done to further include um, overlooked members of our community. Currently, in order to obtain an IDNYC, an applicant must present at least three points of documents proving identity. Despite the long list of documents accepted, including recently expired passports, many I NYC residents, including some of Lizney's clients, are unable to present at least three points of identity. Holding more than one form of identification and even holding one form is a privilege that many of us take for granted every day. Many immigrants escape persecution in their home countries by fleeing to the United States without any form of identification. Others, as is true with one of my clients, adopt aliases to escape abusive situations and leave their old identities behind. Others live in the United States for years and then suddenly and unexpectedly unexpe lose their only identity documents. For example, my client, who is a transgender woman, did not know about the IDNYC program um, until she contacted Lizney. Prior to her contact with us, her passport was stolen. She has no recently expired passports and has been living without an ID for months. Despite fleeing from her home country due to its persecution of transgender women, she has made the difficult decision of contacting her home country's government in order to try and obtain a new passport because a government issued ID is so essential to living in New York City. Um, lack of ID has also di directly affected some of my clients' abilities to access certain legal rights. For example, um, some of my transgender clients wish to legally change their names, which is an option open to all New York residents, regardless of immigration status. However, a name change hearing occurs in a courthouse, which requires visitors to present a photo ID. For IDNYC, if the city council enacted an attorney protocol, similar to the attorney protocol that allows individuals to obtain copies of their NYC birth certificates without presenting identity documents, many more number, uh, members of our immigrant communities would be able to obtain IDs. The attorney protocol for NYC birth certificates allows a licensed attorney to request and obtain a birth certificate on behalf of a client by affirming that the client has made reasonable efforts to provide identity documents but was unable to obtain such documents the attorney assess their client's credibility through an in-person interview and is satisfied that the client has accurately and on honestly represent represented the client's identity based on a number of factors, and the attorney has attached a photograph of the client. Um, such an attorney protocol for IDNYC would make the program more accessible to our immigrant communities and make it easier for them to access many of the privileges and rights we take for granted every day. Thank you for scheduling this hearing and for affording our organization the opportunity to submit this testimony. Thank you. And we're going to probably explore this concept a little bit further. Okay. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Sophia Genovese, and I am the co-chair of the Advocacy Committee for the American Immigration Lawyers Association New York Chapter. My comments today are made on behalf of the organization, which welcomes the opportunity to provide feedback on the IDNYC program, particularly as it impacts immigrants. AILA is the national association of more than 15,000 attorneys and law professors who practice and teach immigration law. The AILA New York chapter consists of nearly 2,000 immigration attorneys and law professors, making it the largest AILA chapter in the country. AILA New York attorneys interact with diverse immigrant populations, from recently arrived asylum seekers to documented immigrants to undocumented immigrants. Our clients, however, are more than the documentation that they do or do not have. They are mothers and fathers, grandparents, artists, entrepreneurs, service industry workers, and students. But most importantly, they are New Yorkers. With that being said, documentation issues can certainly interfere with our clients reaching their full potential. Without identification documents, immigrants encounter insurmountable barriers to accessing basic services. Upon implementation of the IDNYC program in January 2015, AILA New York welcomed the city's municipal ID and saw it as an opportunity to address these barriers. The IDNYC program has allowed many asylum seekers and vulnerable immigrant populations to obtain a form of identification, which enables them to participate in civic life. IDNYC has helped folks overcome barriers to renting apartments, registering their children for school or extracurricular activities, and even gaining access to their attorney's office buildings which require ID for entry. Critically, the IDNYC program has allowed immigrants to open bank accounts. Studies have shown that immigrants are disproportionately unbanked, forcing them to rely upon check cashing stores and lenders at a high cost, heightening their vulnerability for exploitation. With IDNYC, immigrants may now access and open bank accounts, which lowers transaction costs, reduces their vulnerability to theft, and enables them to participate in the local economy. Over the past several years, IDNYC has worked closely with immigration advocates to overcome initial documentation barriers to obtaining the IDNYC card. One member attorney reports that his elderly homebound client, whom only possessed an expired green card and some foreign country documents, was able to work with an IDNYC caseworker and ultimately obtain an ID. AILA New York thanks the IDNYC program for working closely with this individual and his attorney so that he may obtain an unexpired form of identification. However, not all folks have access to attorneys who can help guide them through the IDNYC process or advocate for them on their behalf. Some immigrant populations, particularly those who were previously detained by immigration authorities, continue to encounter barriers in obtaining IDNYC. As a background, when immigrants are detained, their identification documents are confiscated and are not returned until the conclusion of the removal proceedings. Given the backlog of immigration court cases, which is now nearly 810,000 nationwide and 110 in New York alone, immigrants are often in proceedings for at least several years. This delay results in immigrants not having access to their confiscated identification documents for many years. The situation severely impacts newly arrived asylum seekers who came with very little documentation to begin with, if any at all. As has been previously suggested by immigration advocates, we continue to encourage the expansion of the IDNYC required documents list. In particular, we suggest that DHS documentation be added, such as detention release documents, so those who were previously detained and whose documents were taken can obtain some form of identification to access city services. Just a few more minutes. For asylum seekers in particular, whom have overcome and escaped severe persecution, such an addition to the list would help to dismantle one of the many barriers they encounter on the road to safety. AILA New York continues to support the privacy standards of the IDNYC program. Such privacy protections encourage, instead of deter, immigrants to use the program. In its June 2018 quarterly report, the HRA for the city reaffirmed its commitment to preserving the privacy of immigrant New Yorkers by reporting that IDNYC denied a request from DHS for an applicant's identification information. We continue to support and applaud the privacy policies of the program as it enhances the safety of all New Yorkers. We remain concerned, however, about the potential for stigmatization of the card. 
Ayla New York applauds the IDNYC program for taking steps to ensure that the card is desirable to all New Yorkers by offering perks such as discounts on city services, free entry to museums, and much more. We strongly support these continued efforts to destigmatize the IDNYC program so that there is not an inherent presumption by federal officials or law enforcement that those who possess the card are undocumented. Relatedly, Ayla New York would like to address the recent arrests of immigrants at federal facilities and how the IDNYC program could work to limit such occurrences. Although Ayla New York attorneys have reported great success in obtaining IDNYC for their clients, they have consistently had to advise clients of its limitations. IDNYC is a municipal ID and is only to be used for city purposes. However, not all users of IDNYC know this which has caused some folks to run into issues when they try to use the ID for federal purposes. For some, use of the IDNYC card at federal facilities has led to their immigration detention. Ayla New York believes that an easy solution to this problem would be the creation of infographic material on where to use and not to use the card so that New Yorkers, documented or otherwise, represented by counsel or not, are informed of its intended purposes and limitations. Ayla New York continues to strongly support the IDNYC program and thanks the program for all the work it has done on integrating immigrant populations into the city. We look forward to the continued success of the program so that all New Yorkers, new and old, can get the most out of their city. Thank you. Hi, how you doing? Um, my name is Jonathan Stribblingos with the New York Civil Liberties Union. We're the affiliate of uh, the American Civil Liberties Union. We have 180,000 some members here in the uh, state of New York, um, and we're really happy to be speaking on this uh, panel today, so thank you for having us. Um, in particular, uh, we find that the IDNYC program has been very successful with 1.2 million signups. That's something that we really um, have worked to, to help make uh, effective because of our advocacy around these issues, as well as the other community members. We were able to make sure that the privacy and security of the cards were something that was taken as a paramount concern. Um, and as part of that overall concern, we're, um, we see that the cards right now actually require um, contact to get the cards. You have to go into the office and actually give documents, right? And so in that way, contact is a good form of consent building to understand that the people are consenting to this. We have serious concerns about the integration of contactless technology into these cards um, because the contactless technology, which is um, somewhat confusingly referred to as a smart card, and there's a number of different type of technologies that are part of a smart card. Um, contactless is one of them. There's also um, contact technology that could also be a smart card. What we're referring to here is what's generally referred to as RFID, or radio frequency identification, which is the baseline for contactless technology. Unfortunately, those uh, forms of technology can be read at a distance without someone knowing that the, that, you're, um, that the card is being read. How much distance? Well, this is a question. Uh, security professionals have shown that um, many forms of RFID can be read from 250 feet away. Um, some forms uh, can be read from 50 feet away. And so this is something that we're very concerned about in the integration of any form of contactless technology. RFID is not a standard. Um, it's a number of different technologies. Um, there's no formal standardization of what RFID means. Um, and each vendor um, sells it on different bases. Um, and those, those vendors- Can you repeat that again? Each vendor what? Sells um, RFID with different um, criterion on a different base, on different bases. So, so you can, essentially you're saying you're, you can kind of shepherd slash create your technology of, of choice as a, as a vendor relationship to a person or a group or a city. Yes, and that, um, well, more importantly, um, MyFair, one of the main uh, RFID vendors, actually their card was proven to be uh, very insecure and could um, be spoofed, I meaning you could create a fake card um, very easily, and it's been uh, obsolete for about, uh, there's probably 10 years. However, uh, they're still in use. There's about a billion of these cards that are, that are being sold um, across the world, and so this is something where we don't want to see these uh, technologies used in ways that could uh, add vulnerability to the cards or the, the community. In particular, um, there's a conversation about a near-field communication, which is NFC, which is a form of RFID. Again, it's a, a wireless communication standard. And um, fundamentally, what RFID does is it responds to radio waves, so the, the cards are tags that respond to a reader. The person with the reader controls how far the read range is, right? So you're, because you have a reader, if you have more power with your reader, you could read a card from a bigger distance. 
right? And so this is what, even with near field communication, what the city stated was that it was a 10 centimeter um, distance. However, um, with a more powerful reader, you can um, actually know that a card exists there. You can see that it's there from 50 feet away. Right? And so this is proven by security professionals and that's a big concern for us in terms of people having these cards. And we wanna make sure that that, that sniffing can't happen. We don't want these cards turned from something where we had um, them used as a shield by communities now and, and we don't want that being turned into a weapon to use against communities to be able to surveil where people are walking to or where they're going um, in, in the community without them knowing that that's happening. Um, and so what we've also seen is that these um, by putting many functions together, it can be, uh, create a data pool that can create easy de-anonymization. So there's a lot of talk in the industry about the fact that all the data would be um, anonymized in banking or in travel. However, when these things come together, um, only three points of data, academics at studies uh, have shown, can de-anonymize the whole set. Right? So if you know when, when someone travels, how often they use their bank and, and where they're going to, you can de-anonymize them through the whole past history that they've had, which is another concern we have about integrating these forms of data together. Um, and finally, um, you know, this could can have constitutional implications because of the Supreme Court's recent holding in Carpenter v. U.S., where they found that uh, individuals have uh, a privacy right in their uh, personal transit and in their, in their, in their personal location which this could raise questions around. So we wanna make sure that this is done correctly in terms of that. Um, so and I is, that, is that case just connected to a city, like a city program or is that and That was cell phone everything. monitoring. That was around uh, the, 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 the privacy interests of an individual in their uh, cell phone location. Um, Got it. And so this was over time. So really all of us are at risk right now all the time with my phone and my, my credit card. And mm -hmm. so this is really more of like a PSA for everyone. Um, I think it's something that all of us should take seriously, definitely, and the, and the Supreme Court has recognized that in, in a general way. I do think that, um, in particular, we don't want to create new avenues for people to be, especially people who are from vulnerable populations, to, to create um, uh, easily monitored <coughs> da uh, location data. Got it. Um, Thank and you. So, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any, any last comments? Just I that took we a do, lot of We do support the, the idea of the um, IDNYC and we want to honor the original principles of it and, and, the, and the privacy. So we really thank you for having this to make this make sure we do this right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Betsy Plum and I'm the Vice President of Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you to the City Council and Council Member Menchaca for calling today's important hearing on IDNYC. I wanna start by saying how proud we are of this program. We heard a lot about that for a couple of hours today. Since its inception, it has been vital, it's been well received, and because of this program, we've seen barrier after barrier um, be overcome to create a truly more inclusive and welcoming city. I also want to note that much of IDMYC's success came from its roots in community organizing and the city really listening clearly to what communities and advocates were calling for to ensure the safest and most inclusive program. This is a major reason why we were so surprised and frankly concerned uh, when the mayor's office issued an RFEI last year with no advance notice to advocates or the community seeking proposals from financial service providers to embed smart chips into IDNYC cards. Uh, I wanna, I think you know, we need to absolutely put this in the backdrop of the federal moment that we're in. Uh, it's 2019, Donald Trump is still president. Every single day, um, he broadcasts hate and fear from the nation's highest office. His agencies are attacking immigrant communities every single day. Our immigrant communities have been left beaten and bruised by rampant immigration enforcement. And while New York City is absolutely one of the most welcoming cities in the nation for immigrants, there is still a stigma and a confusion around government for many. Um, and the services um, like IDNYC that the government creates and promotes. Um, and even with the best of intentions, our governments no longer have the benefit of the doubt. Um, so when every time the city and New York City looks to make a change, particularly with an absolutely foundational and vital program like IDNYC, we have to acknowledge the fear of immigrant communities and work to break them down and build back trust. And with that being said, it, it absolutely is not the time to dangerously play with a program that has been an incredible asset to over 1.2 million New Yorkers. Uh, so many of those individuals, of course, being immigrant community members. Privacy for this program must be maintained and legitimacy must be afforded. And 
we really do feel that the proposed changes go f too far beyond IDNYC's original intent of providing safe government issued photo identification to immigrant, homeless, and other New Yorkers. Uh, in fact, they run completely contrary to this goal, effectively creating a re-envisioned program that sacrifices the safety and security of the cardholders who most rely on the program. Uh, we absolutely um, appreciate efforts to explore what more can we do to create a more robust program, and we want to support that. Uh, I think the question is, do the goals that the city, um, the goals that the city are seeking, does IDNYC always need to be the means to the end for those goals? Uh, I don't feel that today's conversation has adequately explained the realm of possibility to actually see uh, what the city would want uh, or what would be acceptable to community partners like the New York Immigration Coalition or that it has fully explained the risk and that's why we as advocates are here today. Uh, I think that if we aren't able to fully guarantee the safety of a transition like this at a moment, again, in 2019, when we have so many threats, we shouldn't be exploring it. Uh, you know, we're sitting at the heels of a potential second shutdown in just a few months uh, with immigrants in the crosshairs. These are the things that we need to be working together as a city on. Um, so for that reason, we are and needing to call for an immediate halt to the current exploration. We are, again, absolutely happy to work with leaders to find alternative solutions to many of the goals um, that they have from expanding financial access to ensuring meaningful access to expanded health coverage or MTA transitions, but we can't have a one-size-fits-all solution via the IDNYC program. And we, we look forward to continuing to work on this, but we really want to be having solutions that are most oriented and coming from the communities that will be most impacted by a change like this. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm building on the comments from my colleagues here. We're part of the same coalition, NYPU and NYIC. Um, thank you very much for having us. Mizue Aizeki, I'm a deputy director of the Immigrant Defense Project. and. You know, I think um, the risks that we raise are not unfounded, right? Everyone is familiar with the breach to Experian, the credit uh, rating, credit score thing. Facebook, everyone's learning like, wow, all this information has been shared. Um, and, you know, companies, there's big money to be made in data, right? That's no secret. MasterCard talks about how they make, that's their futures to make billions of dollars collecting people's information and selling it. And so, I think when we're thinking about what interests are at play here, this is what to us is like the central questions around privacy and security. Um, obviously, you know, IDP's expertise is protecting the rights of immigrants from deportation. Um, it is not on these issues, and so we went out and we talked to a number of different experts. We talked to the privacy experts in Chicago who worked on their municipal ID program. We spoke to experts in um, England, London, and Europe where, as you may know, there is a very strong, uh, comparatively to the United States, there's a very strong privacy law. It's called, um, what is it? GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, um, which has basically made something like this not possible in Europe, right? So there's an ID system in Ireland, which uh, they call function creep. It first started as like a, an ID saying, you need to have this ID to get social service benefits. Then they said, now you need this ID to get your driver's license. Now you need this ID to um, renew your passport. This law is gonna be probably challenged under these new privacy regulations in Europe. In India, there's also a similar issue with a national ID where uh, it contains the biometrics of over a billion people <laughs> And there was, there's been like 21 breaches of this data, right? Um, in, a, a very personal data. Um, and they were recently, uh, a lawsuit which basically ruled that they cannot share this information with private vendors, right? So the issue related to the changes to the IDNYC, it's no longer an issue of the city's privacy regulations. It's what will be the privacy regulations of the vendor that we use for the transit system. What are the privacy regulations, or practices rather, of the vendor that we use for the financial services, right? And, you know, and, and uh, this point about big money being made, one thing that, um, sorry, I wanted, I had this great testimony plan, but <laughs> there's so much to say in so little time. <laughs> but I just wanted to note some of the red flags that they raised. One of them is healthcare information is one of the most um, 
uh, profitable sources of stolen data, <laughs> right? So the FBI has said to the healthcare industry, you have to be better about protecting your healthcare data. And the way that it works is this. I'm a, a data broker. I'm going to steal your health, your health record, and I'm going to sell it to your insurance company to say, well, maybe this person shouldn't actually be given health care, or why don't you up their premiums? This is all documented. Um, the other issue in terms of money making, um, so uh, the location data, right? So everyone's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could use my ID to get onto the subway? You know, the, uh, in the company that is going to provide or currently provides and will provide the contactless service for the MTA is the same one that provides it in London. And it is no secret that the London police regularly access this data. In fact, it's promoted as a great source of data for local and federal intelligence agencies, according to these tourism reports that they say. And they say in almost every country where there's a contactless system, it's just a regular um, source of information for policing agencies. Now, if I told you that, <laughs> would you really want your personal ID attached to your travel, right? I don't know. Um, Sorry, I wanted to make a couple more points real quick. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the other thing that the privacy experts in Chicago and London, and also I spoke to someone at NYU told me, is that one of the big challenges, and this touches upon what Jonathan says, is you're creating these multiple databases all over the city, which may or may not, may not have that much personal data on the card, but there's going to be an ID number. So this ID number, as Jonathan said, you only need three points to say, well, you traveled at this time. I got that from the MTA. You went to these different hospitals, and this is your entire medical history. I have that. And then I, if you're using it at the library, now I know your address, and I have all this information. Right? And so one of the things that was really clear after Trump became president is, you know, ICE has this massive ability now to get data from all these different sources and uh, very rapidly process it to identify people. Right? So the consequence for our communities is, as you've seen, a 1,700% increase in courthouse arrests, right? uh, reports every day um, of ICE coming to people's homes and finding them. This is one of the ways they find people, is gathering this data from multiple different sources, right? And they say that the more data you collect, the obviously the more difficult it is to protect people. Um, and just, you know, to underscore the threat, you know, there's a great quote, it's not a great quote, but there's a quote by someone from the military who basically says, we kill people based on metadata, right? Because that's the level of precision you can gain on someone's location and identity based on um, what Jonathan said, just a couple sources of anonymized data. Sec a, a related uh, issue is that, you know, the privacy experts are concerned that by adding all these functions to the ID card, you're going to narrow the pool of people who are using these services, right? So if you need health insurance through the city and you're undocumented, you, your ID is going to be the ID NYC. You're going to have this health insurance card. And if you don't have other, if you're unbanked, say, you're going to have this financial services card. So it's going to become a lot easier for people who are analyzing your data to be kind of, to narrow down the pool of who are the types of people that are using all these different services on the IDNYC. Um, and just to end by reinforcing this point about function creep and the IDs, national ID systems are, have been, uh, you know, fought all across Europe and in, now in India. And it's something that um, is very much promoted by corporations like Microsoft has this ID 2020. You know, they want to track every single refugee in the world to be able to say, we know where you're going to be, we know where you're going. And I think, you know, for those people who are on the nonprofit side of it, you know, this is a, ma a major concern uh, because the track record shows that this information really isn't used to uplift people, um, but to surveil them and track them and arrest them and lock them up. And other things, yeah. So I want to thank you uh, all for the panel discussion. And this is not the first time we're talking about it. We, we, I know we've been talking about these issues, and it's important that a public hearing can really lift these issues up. And as we remember, the uh, the commitment to this card as a participatory democratic process, this is important. This is why we're listening to all of you as well. Not just listening, but just trying to understand. I am not an expert in any of this, and I want to. That's the first thing I want to say. So I, I need to learn more about it. 
I think the council member, um, council member Drum wants to, our team wants to learn more about it. So I hope that we can continue this discussion. Um, there, there is no doubt that I, um, that Moya is moving forward with this intent um, and that they're learning as well. And so we want to learn with them uh, and that there are, there are spaces where we can do that together. And I, I just want to offer that commitment to learning uh, and, and that we will, that, that we, can, we can stay learn in the learning process as these things change uh, because apparently they are changing and there's no standard and we're, we're not only in a pivotal moment on the federal level about what's happening there and the changes that are happening there and some, there's some good changes happening there as well um, that, that we can make a better sense about what we want to do and that the privacy issues are not just to this card, they're to the entire ecosystem of access to our financial services. So everybody right now that has a bank account is at risk. That's a terrible, <laughs> and that's the reality that we live in, and so it's just, we should all be cognizant of that. Um, okay, so that's just the general comment. Let me ask some questions about, about well, then what can we do in this spirit of working together? And so then what are your recommendations because I think it's important that, that that be presented to. Not not only do we have to understand the risks, we have to understand the opportunities here. Um, and maybe there are some opportunities with smart chips. If this can happen, this can happen. And so that's something, if I'm not gonna get right now, I wanna get later, so that's homework for us. And then if we don't do smart chip, if we figure out that this is not the option, we still have an incredibly large unbanked community that for the last four years are not getting served. So what are your solutions to them today as we move forward? Because that's still a need right now. And I wanna solve that for them right now. And they're getting, they're getting um, um, abused at these check cash places. Uh, and so they are, are still at risk. What are those solutions? Tell me. Can I just raise one thing in Please. terms of next steps? So um, our coalition has uh, issued a set of questions to the administration, and so we feel like having answers to those questions would be helpful in terms of figuring out what is the next step. And on the piece of the unbanked, uh, we have people from the financial inclusion community that are gonna speak to that point. But I also just wanted to finish by saying, you know, this idea of like, I think it, and sometimes when you talk about privacy and data security, we all feel like, well, we're all screwed anyway, right? Because we have our smartphones, we have our bank accounts. The point that we're trying to make is, yes, but let's not put the most vulnerable people in our city in a situation that is gonna be extremely difficult for them to get out of. And what I'm saying is that they're already vulnerable right now without the smart chip. And so we need to figure that out now. And, and we're gonna we, be hearing from other agree. panels. And so I, I don't wanna let go of that. As we as we look at this future as well, and and so I'm I am I am I am proud of the work that we're doing together as a coalition of advocates and the mayor's office on fraud issues. There's legislation that we're working on right now with Make the Road that thinks a little bit more about institutionalizing the fraud concept and really making sure that our agencies are 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 connecting to communities. And so, th and that's what, I guess that's what I'm trying to say as well. Is like how do we how do we maintain our commitment because there are vulnerable populations today that, that have issues. Um, and some of that is because of the, of the financial, their lack of access to financial institutions and forcing them to move into spaces that are just bad for them. But we're gonna hear from some other advocates on that as well. Okay, um, we're gonna pause here. Thank you for your testimony and discussion and feedback and discussion to be continued. Okay, next panel. We have, and I know some of you have left already, um, and I apologize. Okay, so we have uh, Hispanic Federation, are you still here? Okay, uh, Stephanie Gomez. Uh, Make the Road, Natalia, if you could come on up, por favor. Um, from uh, the SEEK, uh, cult Cultural Society. Um, Harpreet Tour, Dianira Del Rio from the New Economy Day, from the New Economy Project. How many of you are here? 
three of you, I think, are here. And then maybe we can put in one more. Uh, from the United uh, Sherpa Association, uh, Urhan Sherpa. Are you here? You're about to go? He left, okay. Um, Alicia Portada from the Inclusive and uh, Network of Credit Unions, are you here? Yeah, come on up. And then one more, uh, Elizabeth Ryan from the Center uh, for Financial Inclusion, are you here? Awesome, and then that's it. Okay, is there anybody else from the public that wants to testify as a public member of our incredible city? Okay, this is it, this is our final panel. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, I hope that you learned some things about the administration. I know there's a long Q&A, um, but if we can begin to my left. Yes, and then make sure that the red light is on and that you're speaking close to the mic. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Alicia Portada from the Lower East Side People Federal Credit Union. Today I'm providing testimony on behalf of my credit union as well as Inclusive the network of community development credit unions throughout New York City. Inclusive is a national network of community development credit unions dedicated to closing the gaps and removing barriers to financial opportunities for people living in distressed and underserved communities. We believe that true financial inclusion and empowerment is a fundamental right for all. Inclusive members serve over 8 million residents of low-income, urban, rural, rural and reservation-based communities across the United States and holds over $92 billion in community control assets. There are 18 inclusive member credit unions within the five boroughs, all working to provide access to affordable banking services and loans. As locally owned and managed financial cooperative, we are all committed to reaching and serving New Yorkers who are otherwise excluded from the financial mainstream. Specifically, our credit unions actively open accounts using IDNYC as the primary form of identification. We also work to help undocumented members of our communities obtain taxpayer ID numbers, ITINs, to be able to file tax returns, earn interest on their savings, establish credit, and even one day um, complete the dream of home ownership. We commend administration and the city council for having established this groundbreaking municipal identification, offering all our city residents an accessible and secure document that enables residents to access city services and grant admission to buildings such as schools, hospitals, and other professional buildings require, requiring identification. The IDNYC has enabled us to open accounts and serve all within our communities. We have opened hundreds of accounts um, at, the, at the Lower East Side. Um, while well-intentioned, we believe that trying to integrate banking access directly onto the IDNYC raises a host of privacy, security, consumer protection, and other concerns. The credit unions have raised these concerns with the city agencies coordinating this process. While the city has elicited proposals from a number of financial services providers, we, be we believe it has failed to recognize the security concerns related to the overall concept. The numerous ways in which implementation flows could cause unnecessary consumer harm and the inadvisibility of testing such an undertaking with a population that is disproportionately composed of some of the most vulnerable members of our community, with so much at stake for the undocumented, homeless, and other New Yorkers who rely on IDNYC in their daily life, we urge the city to change course. Through our discussions, we have specifically raised the following areas of concern. The proposed changes will risk the security of IDNYC and create uncertainty among the vulnerable communities who most need the identification. In the current political climate, the concentration of information and data from the primary ID, coupled with account access, transactional information, and, pos and possibly the funds themselves, could place cardholders at greater risk, both to federal authorities and to purveyors of identity theft and scams. Data breaches could cause substantial harm to many who may feel least empowered to report or fight it. Financial technology fintech firms will attempt to minimize the challenges to implementing a compliant banking access platform at this scale. Financial technology firms will often focus on technology necessary to design and de a delivery system of this type, 
without full understanding of the complexity in managing accounts that must be compliant with federal and the state banking and consumer protection laws and regulations. As financial institutions, we have extensive experience implementing technology to increase access of our members and communities. Technology firms, particularly those positioning themselves as disruptors or innovators, will often skip essential steps to be in full compliance with federal and state regulations, relying instead on the financial institutions to ensure that any innovation is safe and compliant. This I'll process- you, I'll pause you, sure. I'll, we have your testimony. I want to get through all the testimony and then come back and ask, ask some questions. The first question, actually, I want to say is, do you take IDNYC right now yes. as a primary ID? Okay, and so all the concerns you're, you're, you're kind of really speaking to as a, as a strong partner with IDNYC uh, to the technology that is being discussed today. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's really important that you're here saying what you're saying. So let's okay. pause it here and then we'll... Sure. Uh, who are, who's going next? I'm sorry, I'm going to... I just asked because I have to go and pick up the kid, so okay. I got to run. Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. and thank you for your patience. I got to run. Absolutely, please. Uh, first of all, thanks for um, giving this opportunity to speak, and also this is something, you know, which because the day I landed here 30 plus years ago, I have been working with the people who have the documents, who don't have the documents, and stuff like that. And the biggest challenge was that's what I'm going to address here, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and I, w I promise I will be done before the four minutes are over. Um, like I said, I have seen firsthand the difference that owning a municipal ID makes the people's lives, how it offers them a sense of belonging, which they did not have before, and the sense of power that, okay, they have something, and they can get recognized that, okay, this is her prey. The Seculture Society in South Richmond Hill neighborhood in, of Queens uh, had done two drives with the assistance of Moya. First, uh, Commissioner uh, Nishagarwal, she was great, and uh, Commissioner uh, Bita is also great. Every time, you know, we reached out that, okay, because society is located in a way where the access to Indo-Caribbeans, uh, Hispanics, non-Hispanics, and South Asians is there accessible, through transportation, public as well as otherwise. Uh, several of these people w who actually came for the IDs, they were either construction workers or day laborers who stand on the corners of the streets. And they have been here for years, but they did not have any form when they go for work to enter some of the buildings where they work. And this ID actually gave them that their bread and butter to put it on the table for their kids and for their families. Uh, now when one of the guy, the gentleman, you know, after he got the ID, he was actually complimenting me. I told him that he should be thanking the mayor and of course the city council for that. This is exactly what he said. Now when I have to show security an ID to enter a building, I can do it and I feel like a human being and not a criminal because most of the immigrants are these days being quoted as criminal, irrespective of uh, statistically. Um, don't want to go into that because statistically nobody can prove it, including the person who says it, uh, President Trump. I'm sorry I have to say him president, but that's the way it is in this country and uh, that's what is actually appropriate. Uh, the card has been a great benefit to the immigrant community. It provides ways to immigrants to connect with the parts of the city and also accepting the ID by the police department as one of the um, ID source that okay, this is her priest, which has helped the people a lot because these laborers sometimes when they are working, they are working late and they come across or something happened, they can prove that okay, this is what who, who I am and this is what it is. And also the fact that these immigrants who do not have anything, taking their kids to the museums, to the libraries, that was a great benefit. And for everything which I have seen so far in IDNYC, it has been a great success. Yes, it needs to be moved into the next phase, which is of course the smart chip, this and that. I do hear these concerns. Uh, they are genuine concerns, but based on the technology which is are available out there, these concerns can be addressed. 
number one. Number two, Microsoft is behind that uh, ID in India, which is called, called Aadhaar card. And that, yes, it has been challenged, but the courts over there work in a different way than here. The, it is really important that the privacy is protected and individual rights are not, you know, walked over and it will not happen over there. And again, I really appreciate, I do thank everybody, including the city council for going ahead and making those changes which are long overdue. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, and before you leave, I just wanna say um, that we should keep talking. You mentioned day laborers and, and engaging a population. Uh, this is something that's been a, uh, a very important thing for this committee and this council and working with advocates to, to um, not just to empower them, but to give them tools to empower themselves, not just on the eco economic piece, on the safety piece, passing the law and construction safety for all, that's still in the middle and that we're still in the middle of all that. So I wanna, I wanna really um, uh, build a relationship with you and your organization. Well, um, I can leave my business card yes, here well, and I will be more than happy to come back uh, and, and, and I think uh, will, she probably uh, already have my information, but I will. We might, we might but uh, can I put my chief of staff before you walk? Yeah. Walk Thank out. you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and my apologies. Uh, absolutely, no worries. And and um, I hope you can get to your child's school in time and pick, pick them up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member and Committee Chairman Chaka. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Deyanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project, an economic justice organization that works with community groups and low-income and immigrant New Yorkers throughout the city. Um, we were part of the Municipal ID Coalition that helped to create IDNYC, along with many others who have testified today. And we had a specific role um, to make sure that, that, I, that the ID card was designed to meet regulatory requirements precisely so that banks and credit unions and other financial institutions could, with full approval of the federal regulators, accept it as primary and sufficient ID to open accounts, as well as provide loans and other services. We can discuss, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that the other council member had to leave because I was really eager to answer his question, and I hope that we can get some information to him and others. Um, I, I do wanna say that we, like many other groups around the, the table today um, and around the city really applaud the mayor and the city council for creating IDNYC. Our interest in, in uh, being here today and, and calling attention to the serious concerns that the current proposal to expand IDNYC, um, you know, what that comes from is really a desire to make sure that the program continues, that the security is intact, and most of all that the privacy of undocumented, homeless, and other New Yorkers is uh, continued to be the first and foremost priority beyond any other interest that the city may have in integrating other services and systems into the card. Um, I wanna say just unequivocally uh, that our organization opposes the administration's planned integration of IDNYC with financial services, MTA payment systems, and more. This, as you've heard, the sweeping, this kind of sweeping integration would result in massive data collection about IDNYC cardholders and expose undocumented and other New Yorkers to very serious risks that are just unwarranted anytime, but certainly at this moment in time with a more than hostile federal administration. Um, our organization fights and has 24 years of experience fighting for fair access to banking and other financial and economic justice issues. We would be delighted to work with the council and the administration to address some of the barriers that continue to block immigrants and other low-income New Yorkers from mainstream financial services, which is an important entry point to the economy. However, this proposal is not the way to do it. Um, it's vital that the council understand just how problematic and dangerous this proposal is, and we want to say that given the range of issues presented today, the risks would not be eliminated by merely tweaking the proposal uh, or sort of making small concessions to advocates. We really, we urge the council to join us in calling on the administration to abandon this plan. And the reason I want to be so unequivocal is because our organizations have in good faith been expressing concerns since June of, the, of 2018 with the administration and have been told repeatedly that um, the RFEI and the sort of process of 
you know, I was talking with financial technology and other companies, was exploratory, there was gonna be more information, a process, and the next thing we knew, in December, we were told that it was moving forward. If you look at the language in the, in the solicitation for negotiated acquisition, it specifically states that the city is looking for a financial partner to begin providing services on IDNYC cards as of January 1, 2020. So while now the administration seems to be saying they're not on that fast track timeline, we this has been, this is the information that we have available to us. And it feels, as I think you've gleaned from some of our groups, it feels like a very fast moving train that we're trying to stop for the interest, for the betterment of all IDMYC cardholders and the program itself. Um, so I have submitted um, extensive testimony. I just wanna focus on a couple of points related to the banking access piece. Uh, so first of all, I do wanna say that while the ID is um, accepted by 14 institutions, it is true that the big banks have not accepted the ID card, in spite of the regula regulators indicating that it was perfectly permissible. Oh my gosh, how did that happen? Would it be possible to get another minute? Yeah, uh, two minutes. Okay, great, thank, thank you. you. Um, I appreciate that. So um, here's the important point, that while these problems exist and there are important ways that the city could approach and address these barriers, um, and we would, again, there's a whole landscape of community development financial institutions, financial justice advocates, legal advocates, New York City and New York City's Office of Financial Empowerment, which actually has taken positions and implemented program that is quite counter to the current proposal, and New York State's Department of Financial Services, which has been a national leader in making sure that New York City and state's financial marketplace is safe and secure. These are the entities that should be at the table designing the different strategies to get to support the community-based financial institutions in serving more people, to bring the big banks with which the city does uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of business every year, the entire city council, uh, the entire city budget of 80, million, uh, $80 billion a year flows through the banks. The city could do more to bring banks to the table as well. And there are other solutions that we would be very eager to explore. Partnering up with a financial technology company and other non-bank entities is a dangerous and not progressive way to pursue financial inclusion. Um, other advocates talked about the Chicago Municipal ID card. They, mm -hmm. they specifically did not include a financial component, having learned from cities like Oakland um, that tried to attach a prepaid kind of debit function onto the municipal ID card. There was widespread, widely reported problems, people getting hit with hidden fees on those cards. That industry of prepaid um, and these kinds of non-bank companies have a long history of uh, sort of rampant problems, including high and hidden fees, the inferior consumer protections, all the kind of insurance and strong, uniform federal protections that protect all of our funds, those of us who have bank and credit union accounts, they don't apply to prepaid cards. And so it's a very uneven and inferior kind of product that for decades, people that, propo that promote these programs, these prepaid and other kinds of bank account substitutes, they say that this is gonna be the solution to the unbanked, this is gonna be the way to address banking deserts, and for decades, the rhetoric has not lived up to the reality, and it's extremely alarming as well that the city would not only be steering people to this product, but partnering also with a financial technology company when at this moment in time, that is a whole sector that is predicated, their business model is predicated on massive amounts of data collection about people's personal information. It is an industry that has repeatedly tried to break into states like New York and undercut our strong state level usury and other consumer protections. And under the Trump administration, I just wanna get in, the Trump administration and the federal regulators now are actually seeking to deregulate further these kinds of financial technology companies. So the city has an opportunity to work with nonprofit mission-driven institutions or it can partner up with a for-profit or several for-profit entities. And we think that the real progressive approach to this is, is relatively obvious. So and I hope that you can ask some questions so I, some we have a, a lot more to and, say. And Thanks. I'm just gonna leave you with a question to answer when, when I get back to you, but I really wanna hear solutions to, um, what better way to describe it as 1.0, what can we do with 1.0? and I, I, I need this space to be the place where we talk about it and, and offer, offer some of that. Uh, Natalia. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Council Member uh, Carlos Menchaca for holding um, this hearing and everyone else from the Immigration Committee after we press hard um, to make sure that we had this space so that we can hear all the sides and, def and definitely so that there can be a process where community had, has input. Uh, I'm here from Make the Road New York, a community-based organization with five different sites. And, you know, I'm here to speak about the concerns that Make the Road New York has and in, in regarding the potential changes um, that the current administration wants to do to this identification. Uh, our experience working with community members demonstrated that it was imperative that community members who are really vulnerable, like undocumented people, homeless people, queer folks, specifically queer folks with gender expressions different than the binary, had an ID and um, you know, we work really hard with a coalition of folks in the city to, to create this ID. I personally, I brought my ID to show that I'm a proud ID carrier and I have totally benefited from the perks and the museums. Um, and so, you know, we were really happy and so much so that our offices became a place where people went to get their ID, both Queens and Brooklyn. And I can tell you the stories of people waiting outside on lines trying to get this identification because of how much it meant to them. It meant that finally they had something that said their names and their address in a city where some of them are undocumented, some of them are homeless, some of them would not be able to have their right gender marker anywhere else, and with this ID, they were able to do so. We're concerned with the direction, that has not been four minutes, yeah. Um, we're concerned with the direction that the IDNYC program is proposing to take, as now, um, I, we believe that it has been effective because of simplicity. Um, there is no data collection right now. People just go get an ID and there is no worries that there's gonna be information anywhere that's gonna be subpoena, FOIL, or anything. Um, and the changes, which I'm not gonna go into details to describe now because I think people have gone in through it, just makes this ID really complicated and we understand that they wanna make it a multi-purpose and perhaps be the best ID, quote unquote, best ID in the nation but it's not really focusing on the dangers for the most vulnerable. Um, and I think that in this case, sometimes less is more. Um, for immigrants, more specifically undocumented people who it's not a secret that Make the Road works with very closely, undocumented people live in the fear all the time. They're paranoid all the time about surveillance and part of their success in life and how they are defiant in life is because they stay under the radar. Having an ID that all of a sudden is gonna compromise that sort of under the radar, it's not in the best interest of undocumented people. Um, the changes proposed to the technology to link IDNYC with other programs have the potential to increase risk to, of exposing our groups of folks who in this moment do not wish to be exposed. Other experts today will report and have reported on the dangers about surveillance, about tracking, about third parties being able to sell data. Um, in all these mechanisms, and unfortunately, if this program is expanded this way, we as a community organization cannot just assure community members that this is the best way to go. And I think that is key because community members are gonna come to us like they did on the first time of applying for this ID when the renewal comes in 2020. And they're gonna ask us, do we, should we continue to have this ID? And unfortunately, like if our worries are not addressed, our answer has to say or be no. Um, and that's not where we wanna go. We wanna work con and continue to work with the administration, with MOIA, um, to make sure that we have the best ID that New Yorkers can possibly have. Um, but currently the administration should focus on some of the things that in the past it promised the community that it would do. And I'll give two examples. One is written in the testimony, the other one I'll just add it right now. But the city, right, continues to say that they've done the, 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 the work to make sure that this ID is being used to open bank accounts. That is not the case with big banks. It's actually not even used as a secondary ID, according to our members. And actually, when we were talking to them about the expansion, they were like, why are they going somewhere else when they can't even figure out how do I can use my ID to open up a bank account? Again, with the, one, with the bank accounts that are in, the, in most communities. We understand that small banks and small co-ops um, take it as a primary document, but that's not the case in most of the communities where our members live. Um, I actually don't think that there is a co-op or a small bank like this, for example, in Jackson Heights, right? Um, so I just, in the city should really not be in the business of being a negotiator for third parties, either because they want to put fees on us or because they want to put data. The second piece is the pharmacy, and I know that there is a whole argument about why the strip should go there because that's how pharmacies will take it, but I think that the city can do 
other work to make sure the pharmacies take the ID right now without having to put additional technology. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm just going to uh, reinforce that we do want to work with the city. We do want to figure out how to like make it better, and we think that there is ways where we can make our ID better without having to put all these other technologies in all the, all these other things. The last thing that I will say is that the Illinois Chicago, the Illinois Immigrant Rights and Refugees Coalition actually advises to their community members not to link their ID card to the Metro car because of surveillances and because of security purposes. So actually, if you ask me, I would probably, we have the option, tell people that they have to opt out of everything, and this is where I'm saying it just becomes complicated, and right now it's a really good ID. That's all. Got Thank it. You. And I want to come back uh, and ask for those things that we can do right now with the current version so we can list them. So be ready to list those as well. And that's for everybody. Hi, good uh, hi. afternoon. And make sure you're speaking into oh, the, thank there you. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for the chance to speak. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ryan. I'm the managing director of the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axion. We're a nonprofit. We're an, clearly an advocate for financial inclusion. Uh, we work globally, especially in developing countries, um, but we work in, also in the United States. Um, and one of the main things we do is a, a global consumer protection campaign. And so we've this is the perspective that I'm, that I'm speaking to you from, and I think that what I want to say boils down to basically two issues. One is the importance of financial inclusion, and when you and the, the current situation facing people in this country who don't have financial access, um, they are they have to do things in a much more complicated way. Um, and when you when it, when you get right down to it, and you start to look at the proposed idea of electronic payments capacity on the card. People who do not have electronics payment capacity cannot do a ton of things that are essential for current modern life. And even if they can, and from some of those things include booking a hotel, buying a train ticket, I have a list, renting a car, or buying anything online. So. Um, then you look at other kinds of transactions that people uh, want to play, utility payments, rental payments, just paying somebody else, you have to ride the bus across town to pay them. Economic productivity is boosted when people get access to electronic payments, and this has been demonstrated. So it's a, for me, it's, it, there's a, an economic justice issue. The second issue is the question, can New York City, through the ID program, find a better deal for people than what they have now. And when you look at the, the services that people use now, they are constantly exposed to fraud, ripoffs, predatory behavior. And um, I believe that ID NYC and the New York City government is in a strong position to be able to bring a better deal to people by uh, having a competitive procurement, by evaluating closely all these privacy issues, um, including uh, both data privacy and cybersecurity, um, the city can uh, come up with something that is safer than what people will be using if there isn't an alternative. Um, I think the, the city also has the ability, because it can represent volume and because it can negotiate through a competitive process, at keeping prices better than what people are paying as an alternative. Um, putting financial um, capabilities onto a card also might allow people to build a credit score through laying down an electronic footprint. And the whole mechanism for engaging with people through the card is a fabulous opportunity to do financial education. And, um, certainly something that's really needed. So I think all these things could be integrated into um, any effort to put a card forward. And um, I, I would just say, you know, I'm, I'm living in Washington, and I, I'm depressed. I hear nothing good. I think our democracy is at, at threat. And when I listen to this conversation, the city council, the city government, the community organizations, you're all dealing with a real issue is really complicated. You're doing your best to figure it out. I'm like, oh, my faith in democracy is <laughs> not completely broken. 
but um, I guess I would just leave by saying a lot of these issues are, are quite technical, and I think it'll be necessary for the city, and I think the city's proposing to do that, to really get into the, the technical details and make sure that the specifications of whatever card they come up with do meet the GD GDPR standards and, and other really strong privacy protections. Thank you for that. Um, and not, not just the perspective, but the, the affirmation really that, that, that what's happening in New York City is, is, is how I started that the conversation, that this is truly a, a participatory, we're in the mix, our own experiment of participatory democracy and that we challenge each other often to get there. And we're not done this card and this next version of the card, um, we're in the middle of that. And, and so thank you for that, I appreciate that. And I hope you can stay engaged with us. I, I would really like your counsel on, on this because I want every perspective. Uh, and I think that you came up with some really interesting um, uh, frames about the economic justice issues that, that I'm, I'm asking now the advocates to respond to in some ways. I really wanna kinda hear what, what can we do um, and, and, and be specific. I, uh, we, need, we need to understand that um, the work that Moya is doing, and, and I'll, I'll say this, I'm gonna reiterate it when we're done, but um, I, I am not, um, th there's, a, there's a real sense of, we're gonna, if, we, if we do anything, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that it's right, um, period. And I, I need you to understand that, that I feel confident that at any point, if, not, if, if we don't meet those criteria that we're talking about, it's not gonna happen. It's, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and there's ways we can do that. So just know that, that we can kind of stop this. Um, but we are, we are seeing uh, a commitment from the administration to answer the questions as, as it comes. And we're still at the beginning stages. And I know that we all kind of felt a little bit like, whoa, jarring moment in December when all of a sudden there's a notice of intent with, a, with an opportunity for them to contract. And so we're getting smart on that. Just know that that's happening and that's real. But I need to hear from you now. What, what, do we, what do we need to do to solve those economic justice issues? Because our community is still gonna go out there and cash checks where they, they go and they're gonna be in, in invisible um, or in shadow economies that are not good for them today. So what are the solutions? Who wants to start? I want to say that our organization is all about being having affirmative solutions and being solutions oriented. Shoot. That said, if an idea is a bad idea and privacy and economic justice and regulatory and other agencies are saying that this is a dangerous idea, I think it's a little bit of a false choice to ask us to, at a hearing, present you with an alternative. I do think that we should take address the, address the proposal on its merits. Again, there's a landscape of groups that work on these issues that want to educate back the city council and the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. Okay. And we're happy to do that. I'm happy to share some initial ideas. But I just want to say that I think that this, what you're hearing is that this is dangerous. Groups are not going to recommend that people use the IDNYC if these changes are implemented. And I think that the burden shouldn't be on us to come up with a solution if the proposal itself is not a good one. So I just, well, for gonna, the record, feel I'm, like it's important to that say that. I'm putting that burden on you. That's, 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 that's what I'm doing right now. And, yeah, I mean, this is so, the exchange that you were talking about. I just want to be like, I think that's, it's an important and that's, thing. I just want to be clear that that's, that's exactly what I'm doing because part of the concept of this work and this participatory yeah. democracy is that we all hold responsibility for this question, and that's and that's that's real. And so I, I want to, and I'm not saying you. I'm I'm saying the the universal you. Yes, no, <laughs> so absolutely. I, I hope, okay. No, but but it's important that 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 I make that clear. That right now we have a public hearing. People are listening to us at home. Yep. It's on the record. Give me ideas right now. I want to understand so we can push some of these things today as we move forward. Let me tell you one thing. Whatever solutions get decided can be developed by New York City with its power, its leverage, disconnected from people's identity card, disconnected from the ID card that was not created to be a banking card. I mean, let's remember that. While, it is, while the city has partnered and with certain financial institutions, 
groups that, whose members needed ID weren't clamoring for the ID for the purpose of banking first and foremost. It was always a secondary issue, and groups can talk about it with their own members. It was about being able to sh have something if they were stopped by police. It was to be able to enter their s children's schools and businesses, and people wanted a simple, straightforward, standalone ID. Now, I think that the ID program now and its ambition to grow and continue and have longevity and be relevant if driver licenses come about for undocumented people. Now the administration is thinking about how, what else can we do, how else can we stretch it, but there's a break point at which you're losing the value on which that card was initially built. So we've said to the city, well, why not create these solutions on a dis disconnected from someone's identity card because that is adding a That's new layer idea. of risk that's unnecessary. And we've kind of gotten like a blank stare back. And so I think that that is one very concrete thing. The second thing, Good. the network of community development credit unions are not for profit. They are based and owned by members, in, by their members, which are in immigrant communities. They're staffed by immigrants from their communities. They are not-for-profit, so they charge less for services. They're accountable to their members. They are small and, like all nonprofits, stretched for resources. I think having a sit-down conversation with Inclusive, which is the umbrella organization that provides financial, technical, and other support to those entities, would be extremely valuable. And with the credit unions themselves to hear, how could the city help those credit unions serve more people? Between the, those credit unions, which are some of the strongest and most nationally recognized in the country, the city could actually, they, these institutions can serve anybody in New York City. So there's no reason for, you know, someone to not have an account. Now they're small, they're not as visible, they don't have the marketing budgets and, and so on. So, but, if that so act, technology if that's a, and promotions would be another thank you, area. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to make sure that we, 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 we close soon, but this is important to ask. Uh, and this is maybe for uh, Ms. Port Portada um, to answer in terms of the institution itself, because we are, when we're thinking about banking um, institutions and access, we think about the small and the big. And right now the big are having problems engaging us right now, and they're not even taking it first or second primary. Um, what's preventing all our communities, community members who are unbanked to go to you right now? What's, what's the problem here? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. What's the problem? And this is one of the concerns that we have because with this new proposal, we don't really understand how are we helping pe people to be banked or how we are we connecting uh, the community with banking services. And I tell you that um, it's, it's the ID one part and there's a lot of education at the same time because uh, our credit unions, we have a designation that's called Juntos Avanzamos and we uh, accept ITIN holders. We open accounts as well for people who don't have a social security number or an ITIN. So you can have legally an account, a savings or a checking account at our credit unions, and that is fine. And do they have access to online services as well to be able and to there do? There is online services, but it has to be it has to be more accessible. So we 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 are very thankful about the IDNYC card, and we want to work with the city because as I'm hearing here, we're not experts. But, the bank, but our credit unions do have a team of experts yeah. that can weigh in on all these uh, security issues that we're talking about and see. We have a team of IT and customer service on the phone, in person, online, that can answer. And we, this, they can speak the language as well of the people that are you know, having these complaints and these concerns. And so, and I, I guess now maybe uh, I want Natalia to, to, to speak now too, but really then what we're saying is this is, a, this is an access issue, outreach issue, language probably barriers, and just general education about financial institutions and what a bank is. So really this is an education issue, it sounds like, because the, the, the solutions exist out there, it sounds like you can give access to folks with the barriers that we're seeing right now for the bigger institutions. Um, so, okay, that, that seems right to me. I don't know, and so then what, what's the role of the organizations like Make the Road to make that connection? And, and then anything else you want to add in terms of solutions that we can look at and digest today? So I'm just going to reiterate um, sort of a couple of things. One is that we should be thinking about this idea for the most vulnerable because the rest of us um, will have either a, a state ID, a driver's license, or some ID that's given to us from some other place. The people 
who don't have a choice are going to be the ones who are necessarily going to have to go to this ID. And those are the people that we should be thinking about. Like, the city, and I don't understand why when IDNYC is more secure than some driver's license, why banks don't take it as a secondary or even primary. Like that itself will be monumental because then people don't have to try to figure out where's a, a small bank or a co-op, but actually I can go to Chase or Citibank. Not that I want people to necessarily go there, but unfortunately every other block you have one of those two options. And when you go there, they don't take the ID. Um, that's one. Fix the pharmacy issue so that when people go and buy their, 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 their um, um, medicamentos, I'm thinking Spanish, sorry, but the, the pres prescriptions, um, they are not being told that the ID is not actually a good form of ID and that they have to figure out another ID. Um, sometimes people don't have another ID, and that means people should not be walking around with their passport, and sometimes that's what it means. Um, and then, like, if we're thinking also about who this city administers IDs to, then let it be that you can get, like, your either food stamps or other social services with the ID, because the city already has to give you something, and, like, linking those to me don't make, um, like, too much of a big deal, but, like, the whole thing about who has access to my data I don't want another company having access to, of like where I go, um, the, my, my geolocation. And then the last thing is that, yes, a lot of people will go online and maybe purchase things, flies, rent cars, or whatever. A lot of people who live paycheck to paycheck are not going to go and rent a car. They don't have an ID to fly, and they're actually not going to go and buy online because most of the time our community actually supports each other, which is something that we should continue to say that we want people to do to buy from the store instead of online where you, you don't pay sale taxes and the actual city is not getting into um, the benefits of the taxes. So actually telling people to be like smart buyers and do online is also t telling consumers don't invest in your city, don't invest in local economies, which I don't think the city should be saying those things. Um, so those just some like simple things, sometimes simple is more. Yeah, and I, I think that was your, um, you made that point earlier, less is more, and uh, especially when we're thinking about the most vulnerable, and you have to know that we are thinking about the most vulnerable, um, and, and trying to understand just the technical components of this thing. And, and just trying to make sense of it. And so I, my commitment to all of you is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get the smartest, we, we're gonna be as smart as we can on this, on this whole conversation because we, we, there will be a moment, and it's, I'm not saying it's tomorrow, it's, but there will be a moment soon that we've, we're on a path here to really just try to understand how we unlock opportunities for everyone. And, and so maybe the last question, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a necessarily a fair question, but it's, it's reconciling the fact that um, there was testimony to the fact that this card and this chip is essentially an opt-in. So you have to essentially make, make a, a choice to say, I want to open it up to myself um, and myself being whomever. And this card is now in the hands of 1.25 million people in the city. And so there's an opportunity for someone who's vulnerable to say, no, I don't want this part of the card, but I still want the 1.0 component and move, and move forward. I think I want to kind of hear from you as that, because that's, that's a compelling argument for me, to be honest. And so I want to think about that with your uh, understanding, and then also going back to the community as we have and continue this conversation with, our, with essentially your members, people on the ground, and understanding how and what barriers they have when they think about an option that they have to opt into, which doesn't exist today. Yeah, I think everything creates that, unfortunately. And when you opt out, you're making a list of the people who are opting out. So you have a list. Okay, so it's concerned about lists on opt out. Scare or don't want for other reasons that's, to that's, opt in. That's, that's good. Can I uh, just say a couple of things to that? So first of all, if the city is um, effectively endorsing this product by putting it on the card and making it the one institution that the city has selected to offer a prepaid account or whatever it is to cardholders, you know, you're saying that people get opt out, but the city is putting its like imprimatur on it and it's exposing itself and this program to some of the reputational risks if people get run into problems, which they inevitably often do when it comes to these kinds of cards. Secondly, um, as we've heard from NyClu and others, uh, you know, again, we've talked to digital privacy experts around the country. The chip, par if the chip is included and has a contactless ca capacity, what we have been told is that that is not something that can turn off, and so those risks remain. Third, if this is the ID card that people will, will have to use to get access to the health care that was just announced or other city services, it's effectively compulsory for those people. There's not a meaningful opt-out. Um, and I just want to finally point out that in, in um, Commissioner Mostafi's testimony, she did say that 
um, IDNYC cardholders have expressed frustration about not being able to use the card to get banking access. She said in the survey that what people have said they want are locations near them. That means bank branches, places where people can go that are convenient to them. Going from there to now we need to partner with a fintech company where there's, like that's a major air industry where red flags are just sounding, you know, and alarm bells are sounding off weekly because of all the different problems associated with that industry. Um, to, so to go from banking access to that is, is a big jump. No one is saying, I would like a stored value, unregulated um, or inconsistently regulated product on my card. People want equal access and unfortunately in the financial inclusion field, which we have been involved in for decades, there is an, a tendency in some parts of that to say, well, you know what, we gotta give people something. It's better than nothing or it's better than the most predatory option out there. And I would hope that the city of New York sets a far higher bar for financial services for immigrants and other New Yorkers than that. Thank you. I, I mean, I hope you're appreciating the conversation here and I know I am and we are. And so let's, we're gonna keep the conversation going. This is the opportunity that we had to pull everything that we know, not just from the city, but from DC and Chicago, and so voices, we, we have a lot of voices here at the table. At you the wanna add one other thing? Yes, at the please. risk of being completely obnoxious, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, um, we, were, we were waiting for a really long time. This happens, the advocates wait for an hour and a half while one person from the administration speaks, That's and then we're all like, we need to address that, but we can't. I know, I'm totally open, by the way, of changing the structure of how fantastic. this works. So I'm open to ideas. <laughs> I'm yes. open to ideas on how to do that. <laughs> Please, I'm open. That would be incredible, and I think it would also help for a better exchange yeah. with the administration, right? To hear Come some more. Come up with that idea okay. and, and and shoot it to me. <laughs> honestly, fantastic. What I wanted to say were just two other things. So you know, the the challenges with banking access are not just about the you know strict identi identification requirements. There's also um, you know just like the banks not locating branches in communities of color, which is a long-standing, mm -hmm. decades-old mm -hmm. issue. There are laws that prohibit that, but the banks continue to do that. Um, but it's also a broader economic justice issue and it's a matter of people not having sufficient income, even if they have a branch in their neighborhood, to meet the bank's minimum balance requirements, mm. to be able to, pr to qualify for the affordable account. People don't wanna get hit with, high, with hidden overdraft fees that then actually leave them worse off than if they had gone to the check casher, which at least is regulated in terms of how much fees they can charge people, right? And so there's just a lot of sort of fundamental um, issues around income inequality and just making sure people have uh, fair wages to be able to support themselves day to day so they don't have to you know, go to a pawn shop um, and so on, as well as other structural challenges in the banking system that are longstanding and challenging, but doesn't mean that we should just write off the banks and give them a, you know, sort of a, a pass on this. So I just wanted to add that. And then the final point is, um, you know, we have heard from the administration, although this is They've sort of changed on this recently, but initially we were told that part of the appeal of the chip was that it, it, its capacity, its functionality is, is sort of uh, limitless, right? So down the road, other features could be added, other kinds of integration. Specifically mentioned to us was an interest in providing access to small dollar loans and alternative credit scoring to people through the ID card, which for anyone who works in that field knows is, all, is not, it doesn't, it's not as easy and pretty as that sounds. And again, these companies are trying to provide payday loans or payday loan-like products in states like New York where they've been banned because of efforts by enforcement agencies and advocacy groups and others. And so the, the notion that credit could actually flow, which would more than likely be debt traps, given the experience around the country, um, you know, through these cards is extra alarming. Alternative credit scoring often leaves people worse off than if they hadn't been in the system as well. And so, you know, this is a part of why we question whether or not the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is the right agency to be negotiating a uh, complex financial technology kind of contract. I mean, look, these are all fair concerns and we've noted them all. And we're gonna take them and move through discussions, understanding and uh, because we, we all need to be um, understanding this information together. And so that is, that is my commitment and and again, uh, while we're discussing the future of the card, I think there's just so much to celebrate in that we have reached incredible feats together. And that has happened because of the membership organizations um, like some of yours that have just done a lot of work on the ground to ensure trust. Um, and as, as the storms that have tried to hit us 
um, and we've weathered them together, we need to keep weathering these storms together. That's what makes this card so special. It's not just the plastic, it's essentially um, what it means. And what it means to so many people and the access that they have right now is, is transformational. And, and I'm thinking about those parents that came to me that they couldn't go and do after school programming in their school because they didn't have IDs. That, that, was, that was for me one of those moments that, that made this card um, greater than the parts, the sum of the parts. I never knew that word. Um, and, and, and makes it transformational. That's, that's, the, that's the key to, um, that's the key that this is really unlocking for so many people in our communities. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. Let's keep talking and uh, look forward to the next conversation. And uh, I know Moya, was Moya here? So I see Sam, there's more than one folk uh, here from, from, um, from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant, Immigrant Affairs. Thank you so much. Thank you to the team. Uh, and, uh, and I now call this uh, hearing to an end. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thanks.